call the meeting to order. Um, seated tonight will be uh, Sean Mastroni, myself, David Rathman, Ben Philbrook, Gardner Young, and Fred Dykeman. Um, staff uh, administrative review. Oh, excuse me, minutes. Minutes. Make a motion to accept all three minutes from June 17th, 18th, and July 8th as entered. Second. Any discussion? You did a great job on those minutes, by the way. Challenging. <laughs> all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Administrative review. All right, item 5D, administrative review items, 5D1, 19. 125 ZON 38 LLC C. Giorgetti. Zoning permit application for change of use from office to personal services. Permit includes sign. Property located at 38 East Main Street Mystic. Assessor's map 174, block 18, lot 13, zone LS5. Um, this is a case of an existing building. They're just looking to change an office to uh, personal service, uh, wellness business no changes proposed to the site or the exterior parking demand is unchanged per zoning uh, the signs are just going to replace what's there now uh, meets the bulk and use requirements of the ls5 zone um, and really that's the that's about it for that just as a change of use needs to come to the commission for your approval Questions, anyone? Do we have a motion on this application? So moved. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 I'm 5D2, 19144, ZON, Michael Lachance, J. Gibbs. Zoning permit application to construct an accessory structure, garage and studio, property located at 4 Rossi Street, Mystic, Assessor's Map, 173, Block 4, Lot 30, Zone, MHD. Uh, this is a case where it is essentially a uh, homeowner looking to build a detached garage on their property. Now, um, normally something like this doesn't need to come to the commission. In this case it does because for Rossi Street is a single-family house, but it was formerly owned by the Mystic Seaport. It was owned by the Seaport back in 2005 when they did their original master plan for the MHD zone. Um, so it was part of their master plan, and it was just used as staff housing back then. Since then, they sold it to the current owner, who just uses it as a single-family house. Um, he's looking for approval for uh, about a 1,400-square-foot, two-story, detached garage and studio with no additional dwelling unit to be added in there. Um, because it is in the MHD, it needs to come to the commission for your approval. Now one thing with this is that the MHD normally has a side setback of 20 feet, but the language of the zone does say the side setback can be reduced to as little as 5 feet um, if shown on the master plan, if approved by the commission. Um, provided the reduction is conformance with the MHD regulations as far as you know, lack of a negative impact on neighbors. Um, and if this property were in the RH10 like its neighbors, the minimum side setback would also be five feet. So in a sense, it's, it's not something special with the, uh, the less side setback. Um, the commission can require additional buffers or screening if it's appropriate per the MHD, um, and it conforms to all other MHD bulk requirements. Um, and per the zoning regulations, even if something is in a master plan zone, if it's a small enough change, the commission can approve it through their administrative review process. Um, and there, our recommended stipulation here is just that no additional dwelling unit is authorized with this approval, which they've said in their application anyway, but just for that uh, extra comfort. And I believe the applicants 
uh, are here to address any questions too. Have we heard anything from the neighbors? Are there any objections from the neighbors? I have not, although it's not a public hearing. So, you know, neighbors aren't notified in the same way as a, as a public hearing. Is it a recording studio? Um, it's the, it's just listed as the owner's personal music studio. So. <laughs> All right. Well. Make a motion to approve this application as presented. Second. Okay. I, don't have a mic. I don't have a mic, so go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Oh. We, can second. we are short on that. Any more? Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Sir. Good item 5D3. Connecticut General Statutes 824 Review, Town of Stonington Municipal Improvements for Sidewalks. Now, um, it was uh, the four regular members and Mr. Dykeman. So this application, it's a Connecticut General Statutes 824 review. So that section of state statutes says basically that if a town um, implements any sort of a public improvement, something like a new road or a new school or even things that are much smaller in statute, um, by law the Planning and Zoning Commission has to make a determination about whether it's consistent or not consistent with the POCD. Um, if it's not consistent, it doesn't hold up the project, but it could force a supermajority vote from the Board of Selectmen. Um, what we have before you tonight is an 824 review for the proposed sidewalk infill project that the town is starting to think about. Um, this is not something that's ready to go as a project, but we wanted to take it to you early in the process. Basically, we've been talking to the Board of Selectmen about possibly allocating some money in the town for sidewalk projects such as Route 1 in Pawkatuck, Route 1 in Mystic, sites in Old Mystic. Um, you know, some money was allocated through the capital improvement budget for this fiscal year. Not enough to go out and do all that, but just to sort of check that box, we wanted to have that before you here. Um, as far as what the POCD says, the POCD has lots of recommendations to fill in the missing gaps with pedestrian connectivity, um, policies to connect neighborhoods, implement the town's complete streets resolution, develop pedestrian paths, improve pedestrian connections to Westerly, develop sidewalks between Pawkatuck and the high school and Hewitt Road in the Big Y supermarket. Um, so it seems like something that the POCD is very much in favor of as a document. Um, so we were just looking for that decision of consistency with the POCD for this. Do we have to approve anything or we just, we just have to? It's just a vote on consistency with the POCD. Do I hear a motion on that? So moved. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And that is it for old business. Um, a word on the awkward uh, PA system tonight. You know, we're short mics. The public mic cable wasn't working. So we have to awkwardly have one of these mics at this little table over here. And, you know, the applicants and the public speaking have to sort of uh, speak at the table like little children at the desk here. So we're sorry about that. equipment in the capital budget, our capital budget. 
And if anybody's not aware, if anyone's here for the public hearing on the Whalers Inn, um, they've asked for that to be continued to the next meeting on August 20th. So that won't be heard tonight. Pursuant to the general statutes of the State of Connecticut revision of 1958 and all amendments thereto, and pursuant to the zoning regulations for the Town of Stonington, Connecticut, the Planning and Zoning Commission hereby gives notice that it will hold a public hearing at the Mystic Middle School, 204 Miss Toxic Ave, Mystic, Connecticut, on Tuesday, August 6, 2019, at 7.15 p.m. on the following application. PZ1916ZC Mystic Seaport Museum Master's Plan Zone Change Application for Changes to Current MHD Properties Structures Including Construction of Two Buildings for a Science and Exploration Center and Demolition and Reconstruction of a Restaurant with a Boutique Hotel Properties Located off Greenmanville Ave, Rossi Street, William Street and Bergman Place, Mystic Zone, MHD. Um, do we have to officially open the Whalers hearing and then close it? Yeah, we, we can do that. Well, yeah, do we do oh, okay. okay. Um, the way the public hearing works, we're first we'll hear from the applicant and then all those in, uh, in favor of the application. Then we'll hear for anyone opposed to the application. And then we'll have general comments. And after that, the applicant has a right for a rebuttal. Um, and then the staff will report to the commission. Uh, seated tonight are our Sean Mastrosani, myself, David Rappin, Ben Philbrook, Karen Young, and Fred Dykeman. Mr. Casey. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. Uh, my name is John Casey. I'm a partner with the law firm of Robinson and Cole, and I have the privilege tonight of representing the uh, Mystic Seaport Museum in their application to amend the uh, master plan that over sees um, all of the seaport property. And uh, what you'll hear tonight is what's proposed is uh, changes and new development to the campus to, to allow it to continue to develop and be you know, the preeminent maritime museum in the country. With me here tonight are Steve White, the president of Mystic Seaport Museum. To his left is David Patton, the chief financial officer followed by Ken Wilson, Director of Facilities, and then Chad Frost from Kenton Frost, who's the project um, uh, landscape architect. And you'll be hearing from all of them, except uh, poor Dave, he doesn't have a speaking role this evening. So the, the Maritime Heritage District, for those of you who aren't um, part of the development when it came into effect in 2005, just briefly, it uh, specifically covers the seaport's properties. Its intent was to allow the seaport greater flexibility in managing its uses and its uh, structures rather than having to comply with the prior uh, underlying residential zoning. My former partner, Tim Bates, used to say he remembers the Newport Yacht Club floating down the river, which allowed the seaport to put in another bathroom because they were over on coverage, they needed variances, so it's a special zone, it's a special designation. Um, it's, it's already in place, and what your regulations uh, allow for is amendments over time, as I said, to allow the, the seaport to evolve. So uh, this is actually the fifth amendment to the original master plan. Tonight we're going to present to you 12 different projects. Uh, they range in size and com uh, complexity, and you'll hear from Chad and from Ken about those. Some of the smaller projects uh, do not require further site plan approval, um, and we think this is the only review that's required by, the P uh, by this commission. 
But for some, um, additional approvals will be required. We're aware of that, and we want to make sure you and maybe some of the public is aware of that as well. Two of the larger projects, which is the uh, demolition of Latitude 41 and replacing it with a, uh, a new building that will house, uh, again, a restaurant, banquet facilities, just like Latitude 41, although smaller, as well as a small boutique hotel on the second and third floor. That is going to have to come back for a second uh, final master plan approval where you will see all the architectural designs, the site plan, all the technical stuff. Tonight we are presenting that one and the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration Science and Exploration Center. Um, I don't want to say a preview, uh, but we, uh, we want the Commission to be aware of them and to um, and make sure there's no uh, real difficulties with those projects going forward, because obviously those are projects by partners of the seaport that need to understand if, the, if there's an absolute uh, prohibition or um, uh, animosity to those projects. I, sorry, I can't think of a better word. So we're going to preview those. And, and hopefully what we hope to get is um, sort of a preliminary approval of the concept, knowing that the details are going to have to come later. So, um, and again, you'll hear more about those from, from Chad and, and Ken. With, um, with that, let me turn it over to Steve White. Um, Steve, as the president of the Seaport, obviously guides all the development and we think it's appropriate that you hear sort of the big picture of what the seaport intends for its future, you know, for itself, for the community, for its guests. So with that, I'll turn it over to Steve White, and I'll be back. This really is like being back in kindergarten. <laughs> could, you get a, could you get a lower desk, maybe? Okay, uh, good evening, uh, commissioners. Thank you very much for considering our master plan amendment and for the time and effort it requires to consider uh, this application. We greatly appreciate it. Mystic Seaport Museum is uh, on the eve of its 90th anniversary, which we will celebrate on Christmas Day uh, 2019. Uh, we celebrate not only our our anniversary, but also our status as our nation's leading maritime museum and arguably one of the top maritime museums uh, in the world. For those 90 years, we have been invested in creating memorable experiences for our visitors, uh, school children, families, maritime scholars, in our effort to inspire an enduring connection to the American maritime experience. We care for roughly 30 acres of land in, in Stonington, in Mystic, uh, with some 100 structures uh, on our property that have roofs. Some of them are rudimentary sheds, but others are significant buildings like the Thompson Exhibition Building, the Stillman Building, and others. Many of those structures are historic and part of the Greenmanville story, which we also try to tell through our exhibitions um, and programming. We employ roughly 200 to 340 people, depending on the season. Uh, we are proud of the, the qualities that our staff bring, and we also um, uh, employ the services of roughly 500 volunteers who spend anywhere from one day to, to five days, in one, in one particular case, uh, supporting the museum and our efforts uh, to inspire that enduring connection. We believe that we contribute and have contributed over this time uh, significantly to the local economy, that we're good for the, for the town, good for the region, uh, and that we've worked diligently to be a good neighbor throughout that 90-year history and to create and to be a positive contributor uh, to the greater mystic region. We are privately funded. Uh, we also apply for private and public grants, competitive grants, on the national and, and, and state level. But essentially, we are self-sustaining and are responsible for our own financial well-being and for the keeping of all of our, uh, 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 of all of our property. 
Clearly, as, as, um, as John said, we have evolved over time from our humble beginnings of two small buildings, once owned by the Greenman Manufacturing Company, to what Mystic Seaport Museum is today. Throughout that time, uh, focused on building and focusing on memorable experiences um, and developing our collection, which now stands at roughly two million objects housed in the restored uh, Rossi Mill, part of our collection uh, research center. Like any organization, we've been uh, in the midst of a strategic planning process over the last three years to replace a strategic plan that was put in place in 2009 following the recession. Those were very difficult years uh, for all of us. Uh, this new strategic plan builds on the success that we've had in recent, in recent years as we try to stay relevant and sustainable as an organization. The vision that was, that was employed as we looked at this strategic plan uh, was to reimagine the interchange between maritime heritage and broader contemporary culture. And one of the things that's, I think, significant about that vision statement is the addition of the word contemporary to the language and the vernacular of Mystic Seaport Museum. To be sustainable in today's environment and today's economy, we have to be relevant to younger generations that may not see themselves in the same sort of maritime heritage that their predecessors did. And thus, we need to evolve with them uh, and make sure that we are true to our core values, which focus on things like authenticity uh, and stewardship, but also have the courage to embrace change and to look forward uh, to attract new and, and younger audiences. Thus, uh, we've been looking at all of the museum assets over the last couple of years. Uh, we've looked at our grounds, our entire 30-acre uh, campus. We've looked at our, our buildings, uh, every single one of them, uh, and our programs that we employ for the public, particularly our educational programs. So we ask these questions of ourselves. Are these facilities and are the grounds uh, truly working for ourselves? Uh, do we find the highest and best use of that property and, and those objects and those buildings? Uh, do they contribute to the vision in some way to reimagine that interchange? And how do they emphasize uh, the connection uh, to the sea that's so important for the ethos of the museum. Therefore, uh, we've made some significant decisions along the way. I think the Thompson Exhibition Building is a good representation of that kind of decision making. Uh, we've made decisions about other elements of our plant that you'll see tonight. Uh, we've embraced uh, new partnerships to help us add value to the visitor experience and value to the overall operations of the museum. And we were adding new programming to showcase our collections and to promote learning. So that's a, a snapshot of, of what we've been up to the last couple of years, why we're before you tonight as we look to make changes uh, to our master plan. And uh, I thank you for your consideration and we're hopeful for your support uh, of our vision and our goals going forward. And with that, I think I'll turn it back to John. Thank you very much. And actually, just really briefly, we're going to have uh, Chad and Ken come up. And I think because of the situation here, it's probably best if they just both be here, because they both have. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. bring you up. Back to back, maybe. Yeah, that's it. That's right. It'll be just as awkward. Can I, I put it over here for that. Do you want to point on the other Have a seat with me, Ken. Why don't you have a seat with me? And I'll
All right, we're good. Uh, good evening. My name is Chad Frost. Again, I'm a principal with Kent Frost Landscape Architecture, uh, and Ken Wilson is here, Director of Facilities for the Seaport. Uh, we've been in front of you multiple times now with this master plan update. This is the plan that you've seen multiple times. We've added some color to it. Uh, it's the same set of plans for the public to be able to see so we don't have to turn everything around uh, and allow the public to, to view it at the same time. Uh, as John mentioned, we're here for 12 projects or to discuss 12 projects. Ten of those is what we're looking for, actual master plan approval, and two we're looking for some discussion and feedback. Uh, the first one that we will talk about is the, the Science and Exploration Center. So that's located up here in the south parking lot. To locate everyone or to orient everyone to the campus, that's Route 27. This is the whole seaside campus. This is the south parking lot and the north parking lot and Rossi Mill to that end of the paper. So everybody understands where we're at. I'll, I'll point for you so you can <laughs> Okay. Um, perfect. So, so in the south parking lot right there, the building next to the orange building uh, is the Mystic Williams College structure. So there's a, already an existing structure in that parking lot. Yep. Uh, we're looking to put a very simple uh, contemporary structure next to it. We're calling it two different structures, but it will be it's built in two phases. It will be one building in the end when it operates. Um, and it will house what's called the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration. This is a partnership that's already uh, working with the seaport. They have a really cool system of underwater uh, rovers. Is that the right way to describe it? Submersibles. Them? Submersibles. Um, and they go all over the world studying all sorts of things uh, underwater. You want to sure. give them so some They uh, currently have office space at the seaport. Oh, I'm sorry. They currently have office space at the seaport, so we've had an ongoing relationship with them for about four or five years now. Oh, sure. Uh, Ken Wilson, Director of Facilities for the seaport. Um, and so they approached us about a year ago and they asked uh, if there would be an opportunity to add to their current operation by moving their uh, research and development uh, component of their business to the seaport. They currently have this operation up at Quonset Point in Rhode Island and they were looking to try and consolidate. So we started working with them, uh, looking at a number of opportunities across the seaport property as to where we could accommodate their needs. We came across this piece of property that's currently vacant at the back of the, or at the east side of the south parking lot. Uh, and as Chad mentioned, the plan is to develop the building in two phases. Each, the building total square footage is 12,000 square feet. Uh, the first and second phase would each be 6,000 feet. Uh, the first phase would be the relocation of their research and development facility that currently operates in Rhode Island. The second phase, which is something that they're uh, looking to try and do here, would be to add a uh, tank, uh, a large swimming pool if you would, where they could actually test the submersibles. So right now what happens is they actually build or, and design and operate or design and construct the submersibles in Rhode Island and they have to ship them to New Hampshire to put them in a tank to, to clean, you know, to check their operation. So ideally they would like to bring that operation here as well. So that's, that's the two phases that Chad referred to. It's, a, it's really a very, very interesting uh, opportunity for the seaport. Would you like us to hold questions or? It's up to, I, I'm fine answering them during the process. Mm -hmm. but so it's a 12,000 square foot building that's inclusive of phase one and phase two? Yes, it is. They're 6,000 square feet each. And, and what is the height of the building that's being proposed? They will be submitting a site plan application to you probably in the next two weeks. Uh, but the building will probably be, I'm sure it's going to be compliant with the 35 foot maximum. Right, right, right now, each building is, there's the two phases are 60 by 100. We're calling it a story and a half building. Right. A story and a half. Sorry, and a half, and, and it should be under that 35 foot uh, requirement of the zone. Thank you. So the white building is two. phase two, and that's going to be the t that's going to be like the testing tank. Is that correct. correct. Okay. Yeah. Right. So so this is the enlargement of the area. Uh, I will note that one of Keith's comments was about access. Uh, that is shown here, where they do have a driveway in to unload trailers. Um, and the reason we're here, again, preliminarily, is if you pay attention, the rendering is actually inverse of the site plan. 
the site plan has the T going one way and the, and the renderings are the other way. So we're still figuring out some of those issues. But you can get the idea of the style and that it's compatible with the, with the Mystic Williams building right next door uh, in the surrounding context. And just to be clear, the site plan is correct. It's the correct. rendering is yeah. this is This is the plan that you will be seeing coming before you, again, probably in a, a few weeks to a few months. Is this area presently storage? Yes. It, it's presently wood, wood storage. Wood yeah. and trees. There's no parking being eliminated? No. no. And will the tank be open to the public? Ultimately, that is their goal, yes. That to be, be visible. Yes or no? Yes. I'm seeing. To be, to be visible? Open, so okay. that people could go into by, the by building. Appoint, by appointment type of thing? Uh, just, it's premature for me to comment on anything. Okay. Yeah. But it's, it, it's not part of the, right now, it's not part of the exhibit space. Under, of the understood, but yeah. I'm just wondering if they were planning yeah. to have school groups in or... That is, yeah. their, that is their plan, yes. Okay. And is there enough room around it? Well, you'll have to go in front of the... We'll be back, all that. Uh, yeah. back again for all of those uh -huh. detailed comments. Right now it's more about the, the idea and the concept and mm -hmm. make sure there's nothing that we're missing uh, that would really concern you. Thank you. Um, all right, so this, the second project... <laughs> so the second project uh, tonight is the demolition of, of Latitude 41 structure and the replacement of it with uh, a new restaurant banquet facility that also, as John mentioned, has two floors of hotel rooms above it. Right now the plan is for 13 rooms per floor. Uh, and then we also have two smaller buildings located out closer to the street. Uh, as part of that redevelopment plan, and, and that is the intent, is to bring back that uh, more natural, I'll call it natural, even though it's man-made, uh, but the, the native historic streetscape of smaller structures along the road frontage. Uh, and so we have the, the smaller structures instead of the hotel. The hotel is pushed back from the road. The smaller structures are up front. It'll create a courtyard uh, effect for that, that structure. Excuse me, what are those building number 190 and 191? What will they be housing? I understand where they are, but what are they? What are they? So What are they? Again, more detail coming. Mm -hmm. Right now the concept is the building to the left as you're looking at the larger building. The north one. Yes, the north one. Uh, would be potentially a guest suite, a guest room. And so it would be just a standalone hotel room. That's why we're calling, in our application there's 27 rooms. So there would be 13 per floor with the 27th uh, one being outside. It would have its own bathroom. Yes. Yeah. Yep. It would be a standalone suite. Um, and then the building to the south, the smaller one, is a utility structure. So it might be used to, to handle uh, garbage. It might be having bikes there that the uh, guests could use. But it's simply a utilitarian uh, structure. Very nice to look at. It'll be a very nice architecturally you know, significant structure. But it's going to be used in that manner right now. What flood zone is the proposed boutique hotel in? Uh, we have it all in the A8 zone. There's some question that we have to go back with deep and sort out exactly which one is in. But it's right now pretty much everything. This, that's the 100 year flood. That's the 500 year flood. Um, and there, there's the nomenclature from when this survey was done four years ago when we were here for the Thompson Building to now. We'll just update the actual zone name when we come back to that. Um, but to that point, uh, the, the new floor, finished floor for the hotel will be at elevation 13. So right now, uh, part of the problem with latitudes is it's below flood zone, the finished floor, and below the finished floor there's a full basement. And so the basement is at about elevation 2, uh, always pumping water, always trying to, to keep that place dry. And so it's really reached the end of its life, not to mention uh, if we get a significant storm come in, coming in, it's underwater. New right, right now there's no basement plan for it. There could be some utility corridor or something. But the, the finished floor is elevation 13. Uh, the, for your reference, the flood zone, flood elevation in this zone is elevation 11. When we built the Thompson building, we built it at elevation 12, which is the plus one Stonington requires. Looking forward, it looks like Connecticut's now going to require plus one plus one. So we're recommending this hotel to be at elevation 13. 
One of the, um, you missed the last couple of meetings, which we had a very fun discussion about a number of things. One of them was the problems of putting a hotel in a flood zone. Okay. And, and that, uh, although the application was, was withdrawn, you've probably seen the newspapers, uh, and they proposed a hotel in a flood zone. Yep. And DEEP, among others, had some serious issues with that. Yep. So, uh, do you know, you it's right not now? a question, but it's something that, that you're going to have to, I think, a, a plan on addressing. Yes, yeah. definitely. I'll let John address it in a little bit then. Um, some points to make uh, about this project. Uh, as I already mentioned, uh, Latitude 41 is clearly at the end of its life as far as a building structure goes. Uh, it needs full replacement. As soon as you do that, you have to bring it up to flood standards and everything else. It requires a whole new building, so then it opens the options as to what other use, how do you best uh, utilize that, that property. Um, I will point out that, as, as John mentioned earlier, the whole property is in the Mystic Ridge Historic District. However, this building, Latitude 41, is not an indigenous building. It is not there originally. It was built by the seaport as a replication of a ship captain's building back in the 60s, so it is not a historic structure. Uh, it is a replica, so there's no loss of true historic uh, structure with this property. Um, as is indicated in the application, the gross floor area of Latitude 41 is about 21,000 square feet. The new structure with all three floors is approximately 23,000 square feet. So from a square footage uh, component, it's actually very close, uh, even though the Latitude 41 is a two-story structure and this proposal is for a three-story structure. What is the height in the... Our application, we're asking for, to discuss 45 feet. So within the zone, it's, it, 35 feet is given with an option for 45 if requested during the master plan. 45 feet from the ground or 45 feet from the 14 that, that will be one of those details that we'll have to come back in front of you. Um, but as to where you measure and, and all that uh, from first floor, from flood zone, or from average grade. And, and in discussions, we've preliminary discussions we've had with staff, it'll probably have two heights. It'll have a, a maritime heritage district height and then it'll also have a coastal height, uh, and we'll have those details for you. But what do you right, mean? How does that work? Two heights. That, that's what I was asking too. Uh, it, it's a. I'm confused. Yeah. Sorry. Our zoning regulations provide two different height measurements: one for coastal, one for the maritime heritage. One's from average for niche grade. The other one's from the flood elevation. So where the height applies in this district is in conflict with it. Our zoning code has a conflict in it. Okay. Two heights, two rooms at once, basically. That don't, so that don't one doesn't take precedent okay, over just, the other? Just, just so I understand, no. the restaurant will be sort of at ground level, and then Correct. the hotel starts at 13 feet, so it's above floodplain. Is that the general? No, the, the, the restaurant the would be at 13. Restaurant, sorry, would be at 13. restaurant would be at 13. The restaurant would be at 13. Yes, and, the hotel, and two floors above. The, the okay. So yeah. it's a, 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 a trek up well, to get to the restaurant. The, um, yeah. Yeah. We, it should not have to be a trek up to get to the restaurant. Uh, we actually, with grading, we think we can make it work pretty well. The highest point out there is about elevation 10 or 11. Okay. Uh, so to get a little bit of grade to fill up to that front door, make it handicap accessible. All right, so the lowest level is the restaurant, and that will be at 13. The lowest level will be the restaurant. Correct. And that will be 13, elevation 13. Elevation 13. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I just want to be very clear. Yeah. So you're coming to us with a proposal for a master plan change that would include a three-story hotel, three-story, and there's a height variation of over 10 feet that you have not sealed the deal on at this point. Is that correct? Well, let me clarify. So as we've tried to mention a couple of times, there's 12 projects we, we want to talk about, 10 of which we would like to get master plan approval for. So it's a little bit confusing. These first two, both the, the Science Center and the hotel, we're not expecting to get final master plan approval here. We're here kind of preliminarily to, pre to preview the idea and discuss the concepts, not have that as part of your approved master plan when we leave here. It's, I, I know that's a little confusing, but we're, we're because we don't have, we know we don't have enough detail. We don't have the, the final height. We don't have 3D models. There's a lot of information that needs to be figured out. 
but we wanted to be able to bring it to you at least conceptually and have the discussion with you so we understand what the concerns might be so that when we come back to you. Um, so is this part of the open public or the open public hearing where we're going to have a time stamp on when this has to be approved? This section, building one no, no, or two, or it's, I mean, it's part I, of I find it a little bit confusing for yeah. the public and how it was advertised in the newspaper, because I think a lot of people think we're deciding on a hotel on this master plan, and to kind of learn tonight that there's two projects that are kind of thrown in there, kind of seems like to test the water, kind of, honestly, seems a little sneaky, just my opinion. I, well, we're, I, what I would, well, yeah, this is John Casey for the record. Uh, we were actually trying to be anything but sneaky. We didn't want to come in here with ten fairly benign projects, and then a week later come in with a, a the the GFOE project, and then a month later come in with a hotel project. We wanted to put everything on the table and say this is where we're at. This is the direction we're heading. So that as we've been using the word preview, uh, you know, so that no one in two hearings for now could say, why didn't you tell us about the hotel? You came here with a handicap ramp, and now we're getting a hotel. So we, you know, the seaport already met with its neighbors a month ago, six weeks ago, you know, to be totally upfront with them about what they're planning. We we would have loved to have all the architecturals done, but there's partners involved. They didn't have their professionals ready in time to go with this application, but we felt it was necessary to move forward because the seaport has all these other pieces that they want to get approved for themselves. So we couldn't control all the other parts, and, and that's why it's in this situation here now. So. so if I understand you correctly, you are looking for us to approve on the master plan a handicap ramp to a possible idea of something that's going to be presented later? No, Is that I'll, what I heard? I'll, that was just an no, example. I'll go through the other 10 projects that yeah. we're really looking for full master plan approval on. These first two are the ones that we're here pr pr trying to be very forthcoming. And no, say, but you're just giving us information on these projects. We're giving you... You don't want any approval on them tonight. We don't have to act on them tonight. Correct. You want us to do act on the other projects. The other, the other the 10 we expect. And these are just... Just uh, information. These over. are information to be able to get some, to, to allow purposes. you to be able to give us some feedback if you like. Yes. Um, so so that we be can clear, if we approve the other 10, we're not, appro we're not approving anything tonight? No, we, we oh, can no. approve the other 10. We don't have to approve these yeah. two. We won't, it would not be in the approval. These two would not be. To our next month, anything. And I understand the confusion. This is, I will fully admit, it's not normal, not typical. We're just trying to. Uh, as John said, be very forthcoming, let you have the information ahead of time instead of coming back, uh, you know, later and having not told you about it at all. No, and I, I appreciate it, and I appreciate the clarification that you've given it. It's really put it in perspective for me. So I would just like to ask Jason and Keith on your behalf, so these first two buildings that are discussed, they're not part of the application. That's been made clear. However, and so that means there's no time uh, limitation, even though it's part of this public hearing, there's no time limitation for the applicants on these first two buildings. I just want to make that very clear for the record. What would happen is, uh, if a decision is made on this application, these two elements wouldn't be part of that decision. And so then at that point, they are eliminated from the application process. You know, there would be a stipulation that says, that if, for example, if you're going to motion to approve, but we do not include build items one and two shown in the application. Those are not included as part of the approval. Okay, at that point, they're, it, it, they're eliminated from any other consideration. There's no time frame issues because you've made a stipulation to eliminate them from the master plan. So what, what we're hearing this evening is one and two will not be for your deliberations. They, uh, they would like some feedback from you as to, you know, is the direction they're going in, does it make some sense, and like where are some of the risks they need to be aware of if they come back? Does that, that seem good? Thank you. Thank you I still have some questions though on the Yep, continue. <laughs> okay, because to my mind, in the height, there's 45 feet yep. to a church steeple, and then there's 
to a block, if you will. Yep. So that was my hesitation of moving forward with any of that number two tonight. Yeah. Secondly, I'm just curious about the entrance and the parking. If you have a delivery at the hotel or the restaurant, what does that do to the parking in that little circle? So that's a multi-pronged question. Will most of the parking be still across the street for this new hotel slash restaurant? Yes. So the so majority, the, all of it will be. Yes. The, the the anticipation, and there is a right now, the proposed access would come through the the easement on the Boathouse Park property, come into the Seaport property, and then within the yeah. courtyard of those buildings, there'll be a drop-off area. It's yeah. it's basically a valet. And that's um, a, this is okay with the Boathouse folks. I can't answer for the Boathouse Park, but that easement is something that's exclusive right now to the Mystic Seaport. So if you go on to the town-owned land, you'll see there's a fence along the southern perimeter, and then there's the Mystic Seaport loading area. That area, that Mystic Seaport loading area, is, is the easement area that is, that's actually town-owned land. So. Thank you. The property line for the Seaport property is basically almost the building line of Latitude 41. So that whole gravel area with the fence, that's the easement area on the Boathouse Park property. And so it's currently being utilized, the plan is to utilize it just for the access coming in for this project. So, so if you're looking for suggestions, yeah. okay, it seems to me that one of the things you're gonna to have to address is, is how the restaurant and the Boathouse will share that driveway with some rowing crew member's dad in a big SUV with a, a rack of boats trying to back in there on a Saturday afternoon in the middle of a wedding. Uh, it, you know, it sounds like a recipe for disaster, and it's, and it's going to involve us, I think, getting comfortable with both uses of that little strip of gravel, which I'm, you know. It's, it's, it's only used by the seaport today, correct? There's a fence on the correct. north side of it. Correct. There is another entrance to the boathouse. This is Correct. just, this Correct. Is just uh, exclusive use of the seaport yep. at the present time. And, and again, we'll come back with, with all the details okay. that you need future, but it's just that the concept is it comes in through there. There's a valet. There's no long-term parking on this side of the campus. Valet parks all cars are crossed by the Rossi Mill in the north parking lot. Um, as far as deliveries go, there is the north laneway, which currently gets deliveries. That's where a lot of deliveries and in, in internal seaport uh, operations happen. Which, which comes, this is the Thompson building. Yep. And the north laneway comes right down up to the north of it. Um, and so this hotel could be served, the service area, through that laneway as opposed through the valley drop-off so that we can separate both the guest experience and the, and the use experience. Great, thank Again, you. Conceptual mm -hmm. and details to come. So, again, if you're looking for feedback, yep. when you bring this forward, I think it has to be very detailed as to what the view will be on all four sides, from the water, from uh, River Road, from 27, <coughs> right? And in not only just that area, but the vista, right? And I would like to know how close that is to the water, how close that is. Are you going to have patios around it? Are you going to have plantings around it? What, you know, how that's going to work? So, so yes uh, is most of those answers. Um, and I will say right now the plan, as we've shown it here, is that the western edge of the restaurant hotel structure aligns with the western edge of the Thompson building. So the that plane is continued and not one is proud of the other. Um, there will be outdoor on the water side, a patio that's associated with the hotel, the restaurant, uh, the banquet facility. That's so outdoor eating on the water. To some degree, yes. Yeah, just as there currently is now uh, with Latitude 41. How, how much closer is it to the river than Latitude 41? How much closer have you moved the building to the water? 115 feet? 115 feet. Thank you. And remind me of the stone bulkheading. How far does that go? Where does that end? It wraps all the way around the property. It does. Yes. It goes to the park. It goes yep. to the park. 
Okay, I didn't realize it does. Yeah, it wraps all the way around basically where that the wooden fence is there and the dumpsters at the end of that. It, it comes, comes up and okay. turns, the, the wooden fence connects to the end of the bulkhead. Thanks. Okay, I forgot how far I went. Yep. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Uh, I will just to briefly talk about parking associated with that. That was one of the staff concerns. Um, again, all the details to really come out in the future. Um, but the way we've calculated it is there will actually be a, a reduction in the proposed amount of seats with the new built with the new restaurant, new banquet facility. So Latitude right now is a very large uh, restaurant banquet facility. They have uh, approximately about 590 seats uh, currently with them. Uh, that that comes up to 197 required parking spaces by uh, your regulations. We are the proposed hotel or proposed restaurant would have 470 seats, so a reduction of about 120. That requires uh, 157 parking spaces. When we add in the hotel rooms, 27, one per room, that's a required spaces of 184 spaces versus currently the required 197 spaces. So we're we're, rec we're acknowledging there's probably a reduction in actual parking demand, and currently the seaport meets its current demand from an overall parking uh, point of view. So there's a surplus of parking at the end of this project. However, you're building one, your, your ocean tank building. Yep. Uh, is that taking away any uh, parking spaces whatsoever, it, and you're not going to increase the number of parking spaces for associated with that for future use? So there will be a slight redesign of the parking lot along its eastern edge uh -huh. to facilitate access to the structure. Uh, and then moving the act, the current access that services the storage area for the shipyard is going to get moved further south. So that back row will be reconfigured. There will be a net gain of some parking spaces. I'm not okay. sure just yet how many. Uh, there are only proposed to be about 10 employees in that structure, so it's a very small use. Thank you. And again, their offices are already on, on campus, so some of that use is already there from a parking perspective. Um, any other questions or feedback for those two projects before I move on? Mm. No? All right. Um, so the third project is the galley expansion. Um, so, so the galley, this is, that's the galley structure. If you've been on campus re recently, that's where you can go and buy food, obviously. Um, right now, Latitude 41 does quite a bit of food service prep for the rest of campus. When that building goes away for the new one, they're going to need to expand the galley in order to provide more for food service on campus. So that's what, what that expansion is basically there. Um, it will be slightly visible from Greenmanville Avenue. We've been in front of the Architectural Review Board. They didn't have any questions. We don't have full-on architecturals for it. It will meet the architectural style and the features of the existing galley building. Uh, and so there are no change in public views or impact to the character of the neighborhood and it meets the, the, the district requirements as far as uh, the aesthetic component of the, the addition. It looks like that addition goes toward Greenmanville Avenue to the east and then, and then south toward the visitor center, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So it basically and fills in an, uh, an L yeah. of the building that's missing. And how, and big, squares is, it how big is that addition? Um, I would say it's about 20 feet wide, 40, you know, so, how many? A thousand square feet in that? A thousand to 1,200 square feet. A thousand to 1,200 square feet. Yeah. It's filling in an area that basically vacant by the building and then it butts up against the existing loading dock that's currently. It'll be a single story building? It's currently anticipated to be single story, yes. yes. And that won't inhibit the deliveries and... Okay. Well, yes. Yeah, so the delivery area is going to that whole thing is going to have to be reconfigured. Because isn't that where the delivery trucks yeah. go yes, now? Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah, but that's where deliveries will continue to go in the future. So it'll just get reconfigured to work for the new structure. So you keep on using the word anticipated. Is yes. it single story, or are you thinking it's single story, but it could be two story? This application is single story. Okay. Thanks. If if anything changes in the future, we'd have to come back for you, okay. uh, you know, to change that to a two story structure. Thank you. Site plan, yes, we can come back in front of you for a, a site plan review too. 
Um, just responding to one of staff comments, because of the architectural component, there was a question of if it could receive full master plan approval. We're, we are requesting that it, it does get full master plan approval tonight, and we can come back later for full on site plan review uh, to be able to see all the architecturals and, this, and the site plan configuration, the, re, the loading dock reconfiguration at a time when we have those details. If that makes sense. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that uh, if we give full master plan approval without having the site plan, although there could be minor changes, you know, things like the size of the buildings, the height of the buildings, the location of the buildings, you know, I'm not talking about here or foot there. Yeah. I believe that should all be in the master plan before you give full master plan approval based on uh, based on uh, you know the way our regs read as to what we can then change during a site plan. The way we have, and I would agree, right. some of that. The, the way that we have dealt with. Uh, the majority of the campus master plan updates over time and the rest of these projects is uh, not to that level of detail during the master plan and then they get either finalized during the, the site plan and in a lot of cases for projects that are completely internal to campus they don't come back to you because it's an internal campus thing the master plan is what's basically now the zoning governing document whatever is agreed to today if it's a one-story structure at this footprint that's what's in the master plan, and we won't exceed that when we come back for you with the site plan at a later date with the rest of the details. Um, I understand it's you would like to have sometimes more information, and a lot of times, the last two times we've been here, it's been a combined site plan and master plan, so we had all the details. This time it's just master plan, and then some of the projects coming back for that additional site plan stuff. You could stipulate uh, that building number 50's height is for project number three is the maximum height for that addition if you're worried about height being because right now they've defined the scope of the X and Y and if you're worried about the Z axis right and then uh, aesthetically this is there is a little bit of visibility from route 27 but this is a back of house area to begin with so you know keep that in mind too this okay. So, um, how how much time would elapse between tonight and when you would have all these details ironed out? I mean, is it, are we talking a matter of a few weeks or a year or? or? This could be any place from a, a few weeks to multiple years. So th this is, as Chad pointed out, this is uh, an anticipate. Again, we are trying to. The master plan process for the seaport is one of anticipation. We have to come here before you and explain what it is we're thinking about doing, what we'd like to do. We get we receive master plan approval from you to do these things. Then as time permits and as financing permits, we move forward with the various projects. We're trying to be uh, cost effective here this evening by trying to put you know, uh, ten, 10 things on the agenda that we would like to do. It's costly for us to come here not to mention the fact we have to notice all the neighbors and everything else. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, again, as I said, it could be two year, you know, two weeks or two years before the need arises for us to do that. A lot of that would be predicated. I mean, keep cutting you off. A lot of that would be predicated on the success of the replacement for Latitude 41's application. Mm -hmm. sure. So at this stage, you'd be happy with sort of a conceptual agreement without necessarily an approval or disapproval from the commission? Well, this, this project specifically, um, we're defining the area, we're defining where it is and defining what the use is, which is very in line with your master plan zoning. Uh, what's different from this, pro this particular zone, because it's governing just the seaport, and it's not, you're used to some master plans where it's a, it's a large project that's fully developed and it's going to be developed mostly at once for the mo or maybe a couple of phases. This is like an evolving 
master plan. It's a living document that's constantly growing and updating and changing. And so when we have to come before you for every small thing, so a lot of businesses wouldn't have to come before you to you know, enlarge their kitchen, right? But because this is a, a special zone, any little project that we do, we have to come before you. So they basically need to enlarge their kitchen. We know where it's going because of the building that it's basically an addition to. It's not going to be three stories high because there's a one story addition there. We're just trying to put the addition on and it would be very cost prohibitive to have the seaport have to go through full architectural drawings to tell you this is exactly what that addition might look like if in the future you approve two other projects and then we can go ahead and build this project. So that's why we're trying to define as much as we can, give you your right to be able to say this is the confinement that we're putting you into. We've agreed to expand the, the galley by this much if, if it, for some reason the need doubles, then we have to come back in front of you. If, if they need a second floor, we have to come back and for you. So we'll, we're willing to give you all of those parameters and just say that the architectural style has yet to be resolved. And, and if you'd like us to come back to review that architectural style or have us go back in front of the architectural review board, we can definitely do that. Um, but we'd like to have the confidence that this is an acceptable project within the campus master plan. Next one. Next one. Uh, project four, in the Rossi Mill, uh, as was mentioned, the Rossi Mill houses thousands of artifacts, none of which get to see the light of day, and none of which us as the public get to see. I've been in there a couple times, and it's absolutely fascinating how many things are in there, and it's jammed packed. This project looks to renovate the interior portion, that's about a third of Rossi Mill, so that, that orange colored piece looks to renovate the inside of that structure, no changes to the exterior, the, the mill stays the same, uh, so that the public is now allowed to go through there. It's safe for the public to go through, and a lot of those artifacts are now on display uh, in there. Instead of just being housed and mothballed and kept, and hopefully every now and then something gets pulled out, it opens thousands of artifacts up to the public to be able to see uh, and, and be able to go through. Um, that is, um, it is consistent with Part of the, the regulation, there's a lot of regulations as to what can happen on which side of Route 27, and Section 7.20.2.4 does allow for the Rossi Mill to have exhibit space within it. Will this primarily be for the small boat collection, out of yes, curiosity? It yes, it will. Any other questions on that? All interior. Um, associated with that is project number five, which is all the way up at the top. Uh, so that is a temporary staging for a tent. So if you've driven by the seaport recently, the, the other piece of that is down here. The tent is down uh, currently or was currently covering the Mayflower uh, during its restoration. So now that that project's almost done, the tent comes down from there. We're looking to relocate it up to that parking lot in order to house a lot of the exhibits as the interior of Rossi Mill is being re rehabbed. A lot of that stuff has to go somewhere, so we'll put it outside in a tent temporarily. When the mill is complete, all that the artifacts go back in, and the tent goes back down to the shipyard for use on future projects. Um, could it be erected a little bit less high? Yes. Yes, it's going to be. Yeah. We're going to. It will be lowered by a section. How much is a section? About twelve feet. Only twelve. Are the yes. neighbors comfortable with this? We haven't heard. We haven't heard anything okay. contrary to that. What's the what's the current? We'll, we'll get to you. What's the current height of the tent? Uh, when it was erected over the top of the Mayflower, it was 47 feet at its highest so, point. So you're looking at 12 feet less, 35. 35, 12 feet. Uh, I'll clarify that. The 12 foot section and one two foot section of uh, the foundation would come out of it. So it would be 14 feet. 14, 14, 14 feet. feet 14 feet. Okay. Yeah, I'm, oh, go ahead. And I think the staff recommended it be moved slightly. South, I think. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Staff, we'd be happy to work with staff to find a suitable location within that parking lot. Uh, that's to everyone's agreement. Thank you. So, how long? Oh. How long? Excuse me. How long will that? Do you anticipate that will be in use? So that will be. That, that's kind of back to the same. I'm not trying to be. <laughs> so if. Um, in the best of all worlds. Uh, Couple of years. A couple of years. Uh, yeah, for a couple of yeah, it would certainly be more than a year. Hopefully, less than three. So it's not a permanent structure. No, it's not. Nor when you move it back down, will it be a permanent structure. That's correct. Correct. Right, because so. I recall that when you erected that, there was a hearing, and it was for a certain amount of time, 
or the length of a pot of the Mayflower? That is correct. We did appear before you for that when we came in for the building permit okay. application. Okay. Okay. So we could stipulate maybe three years or something. Okay. Certainly. And, and temporary structures within the you know uh, marina districts are definitely within your regulations. <coughs> yeah. Any other questions? All right. Uh, project number six is this tiny little one down here. Uh, as John referenced, a handicap ramp. Um, that is that entire project is a handicap ramp. So that is the cliff block building. That is the building where um, GFOE, the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration, which is that big project, their um, exhibit space on campus will be in the cliff block building. We need to make it publicly accessible. We need to be able to put a handicap ramp on it. And that has to be included in our master plan because it's not currently there. Any questions? A first, a one, one floor handicap. Yep, room. that's all yeah. the building is. What is in that building now? Out of curiosity. It currently houses uh, an exhibit, the um, candle dipping, and arts and crafts. All right. Project seven is signage updates. So uh, at both main entrances, the north gate and the south gate. Uh, we are looking to uh, remove some signage. John, if you want to put seven. So sheet seven, this is our, our master plan signage that's been ongoing uh, over the last decade or so. The top uh, is what was approved in 2014. This spreadsheet right here is the same list that was approved in 2014. The bottom is what we're asking for in 19 with the changes on this list. So basically, signage is obviously very regulated in town. We keep a very detailed list of every square foot of sign that's visible to the public along Route 27. Uh, and in this instance, we're looking to remove more signs than we're putting back. So there's several signs around the front gates that will be coming down, uh, both at, on, the, on the fences, I'll, I'll say. There's a couple extra signs. Those will come down. A new monument sign, this freestanding sign, will go up one at each entrance. And then the additional sign that's coming down is in front of Rossi Mill. There's a very large sign kind of tucked up close to the building that has a flip on it for where to park. That whole sign is coming down because it's found that it's been causing confusion uh, for visitors. They try to get into the Rossi Mill thinking that's the front door of the seaport, uh, which is not. So that sign is coming down. So, Within this master plan, there's actually a reduction in total amount of square foot of signs. We are holding that, that surplus as a surplus for future uh, master plans as we come back. So signage. Yep. I, I can't read your spreadsheet. <laughs> no, that's why, that's why we submitted it to you. Yeah. Um, so you got we got to to go. Yeah. I, I can't read that either. I'm <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, I know. Um, so total square footage is down because you're reducing the number of signs. However, the sign, the freestanding sign that you're going to have two of, which is kind of a three-tiered with a person. Yep. How how large is that sign? Uh, that is five feet tall, seven feet wide at its, at its widest and tallest. And that includes the per the, the, the person okay. is only illustrative. It's not. Yeah. Oh, that's illustrative. Okay, I didn't know. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, it's just to give you scale. And what is the lighting on the sign? At this point in time, they're not anticipated to be lit. Okay, and that's a stipulation. Okay. Is that new one's going to be smaller than the present standing? Um, they're, there... di they're different, so it's, yeah. I, I can't say it's going to be smaller. There, there's multiple signs mounted to the fence that will come down. Because I know at the north end, I think there's that, what did you call it, the block sign, I think you called it? Well, there's at, at both parking lots, there's two large signs in the island that goes into the parking lot. Yeah. Those remain. So if you're thinking of a, a uh, large sign, those, those stay. No, I was thinking on the east side, west side. On the west side of the Route 27. In front of the Thompson building? Yeah. There are two signs on the curved walls. Yes, yeah. one one on either side of the Thompson. Those they get they reduced to. Re they get removed. They get okay. removed. Yes. Thank you. So the two signs there get removed. One goes back in its place. But they still stay orange. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, any other questions? Signage. Uh, project eight is the cat boat shed, which is all the way down, kind of on the tip. The cat boat shed. 
Uh, expansion. So we're putting a, a small expansion on there, 14 by 24, to facilitate exhibit space uh, and what education. education. What I think is really cool about this is this is a, is a partnership with Stonington Schools. Uh, this is where they teach wooden boat building classes, and so there, there's a new partnership with Stonington to teach students about wooden boat building, and they need more space in order to house that, and so that's what that addition is for. Is that the shed down near the youth training building? Directly adjacent to it. So you're going to expand that toward the river? Toward the youth training building. To yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Like expand it towards the west. Towards the rope walk. Right it's par it's yeah. parallel to the rope walk. Yeah. yeah. Single story also? Yes, it will. <laughs> Any other questions? Project 9 is very simple. It's the gazebo that used to be in the middle of the green. Uh, it fell down basically over the winter. It was, it was deteriorating, became a safety hazard, so it was taken down. That has to be removed from our master plan uh, by the process. Um, you don't want to replace it? No. Not at this point. No. Time. Just remove it. Project 10 is a sale of the Balistracy property, right there. Um, again, as you saw earlier in administrative approval, the Seaport buys and sells property. Uh, it, when it's purchased, it is brought into the MHD zone. When it's sold, it becomes a little bit quasi. It can be either or up to that owner. Uh, the Seaport has sold this piece of property. It has been redeveloped very nicely by the current owner. It's All we're doing is, is noting on the plan that it's no longer owned by the Seaport because that's part of the requirement in the master plan. But not asking for a zone change. No zone no. change. No. No, no, that'll all be on the current owner if they want to do anything different. We're just saying it's no longer part of the control of the Seaport. And then Project 12. Oh, did I miss one? 11. Oh, 11. I did miss 11. Thank you. So Project 11, uh, solar panels. Um, so Rossi Mill currently has solar panels on it already. Uh, it's been very successful. They want to increase the amount of solar panels there. So that, the hatched area of 11 and then the other piece up to the north, or uh, actually the east, um, both those areas will be receiving solar panels as part of this project. Totally not visible by the public, just as the current ones aren't today. Are those roofs flat? Uh, the, the roof that is further to the west is flat. It exists inside a parapet wall. The one further to the east that's up closest to the uh, upper parking lot has a two-on-one slope on it. Okay, so the sawtooth parts all gone on those two roofs? The sawtooth uh, was eliminated that's, on the first section back in the 80s, I believe. Right. And then we went in and replaced the roof on the upper section uh, a year ago this past winter. Good. Thank you. All right, and then the last project, uh, Project 12, is the North and South Heads uh, relocation. So on the, the north side, um, there are currently the North Heads, the bathrooms, uh, mm -hmm. are up there. The hotel development would basically sit on top of them and replace them. So those, that use will get incorporated into the hotel structure. So we're simply acknowledging that there's a building currently on site that will get demolished and become part of that new structure. And then in the south, the existing heads are hidden kind of in a maze of buildings and sheds and uh, stuff. Tuck, stuff. <laughs> tuck, they're, they're tucked pretty far in the back. Tucked in there, hard to find, and so we're moving them to a new location to make them much more publicly accessible. So they're currently down in the shipyard. Yes. Yep. That's correct. And you yes. put them out near, next, to the, next to the pier there. Next yes, to the, the, the proposal would be to put them on Hopi Stock to the east of the flagpole. And then just to, uh, a point of clarification during staff comment, uh, because in our building list, which again, we have, we have a very lengthy building list, identifies every building on campus, um, that South Heads were named the South Yachtman, Yachtsman Building. And so there was a question as to what that building was. And so that's, it's the South Heads being demolished. It is going to be demolished? Yes. That's the old one. Yes. yes. So it's a, brand, sorry, it's a brand new building, the South Head. Yes, we would be proposing to come in with a new building. Yep. How big is it? It, 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 would, um, have, it would probably be at least the size of the current North Head. Right. Replacing kind of the current size okay. and shape so and style and the new location. So it's about 750 square feet. I won't ask you how tall. Okay. <laughs> one story. <laughs> one story. <laughs> one story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that walkway, the boardwalk, 
Yeah. Yes, that would be where the lumber that, storage that, is. Yes, that's yeah. exactly correct. I'm sorry to see that old bathroom go. I could always go there. No one else was ever there. <laughs> Nobody could find it. <laughs> uh, any other questions for me on those 12 projects before I pass it back to John or for Ken? No? All right. Uh, thank you. I do appreciate your time. I know it is a little confusing. It's a little bit not normal. But again, trying to be very forthcoming, uh, let you know what's coming as well as what's currently being planned. Thank you. Again, for the record, my name is John Casey, a partner with Robinson and Cole. I'll try to be quick, especially in light of sort of the discussion we already had about the, the two big projects. But I just want to say, so on the record, um, in our application, we asked for certain waivers from uh, impact statement requirements. Um, and as you've, these probably make more sense now that we've gone through the projects that we're asking for final approval on. So we're asking for a waiver from the public safety and traffic uh, requirement. Um, I don't want to repeat what's in our application, uh, but if you have any questions, uh, let me know. We just feel it's not necessary to uh, relocate bathrooms or add a handicap ramp <clears throat> or put in solar panels for, for the great majority of these projects. Um, there's a roads and drainage impact statement. Uh, we've asked for a waiver of that as well. Really, the, the 10 projects are not going to change any of the use or, uh, of the seaport as it, as it currently uh, operates. Cultural impact. Um, we did provide a statement regarding this in our application materials. Uh, and last was a natural resources uh, requirement, which requires a, a, an assessment by a licensed certified professional specializing in environmental topics. And we ask for a waiver of that since we feel that none of the projects uh, have any substantive or appreciable impacts on any natural resources. They're all pretty much limited to the campus, discrete projects um, uh, that don't require that level of detail. As we said, when we come back, the projects, you know, in terms of traffic, the questions about the, the traffic flow uh, on the easement, and those will all come with a uh, full, uh, full analysis of the impacts, the site plan approval. Site plans will have stormwater um, analysis, things like that. So that'll, that'll all come in the future. Um, in order to approve this, you, you need to find that it's consistent with your plan of conservation and development and your comprehensive plan. Your, your staff's comments, uh, your staff report um, indicated some of the policies that with which it, which, which these projects uh, touch on and we concur that, that those are the main ones. I mean, really for the seaport, I think the number one uh, policy is your um, policy to maintain and promote town's economic drivers. I, I don't think you can say too much about the importance of the seaport to the town of Stonington as a economic driver. Uh, for the 10 projects we're requesting approval on, we feel uh, that these fit um, and comply with your um, plan of conservation and development and your comprehensive plan. There was a few other comments by staff um, that we didn't pick up on as we went through the projects. Um, so one of them was that master plans on waterfront property shall include suitability analysis for various water dependent uses. Um, for the, the, well, sort of the, you know, the elephant in the room in terms of that issue comes with the proposal to uh, take down Latitude 41 and replace it with a new building that has uh, the same exact use, restaurant and banquet, but add the hotel use. Um, you can cut off my mic if you'd like, because <laughs> we can talk about all that in the future, as well as um, 
the comments that you received from the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, because all their comments really focused on this, this uh, issue of, is it appropriate to, to add uh, another non-water dependent use on a, wa on a waterfront site? And um, I don't really think we have to fight that battle tonight because we're going to have to come back for full site plan approval and, and master plan approval. But there's a few issues, and, you know, I, I don't know that the people up at DEP fully appreciate it. And I work with those people regularly and actually tried to spend some time speaking to them about this project. So the thing to remember is um, the seaport currently has overnight guests on the western side of the pro property. They are uh, transient boaters. They have a number of people who come and tie up their boat and stay for a number of days. There's overnight campers who come to camps throughout the summer and even outside the summer. So the idea, the concept of uh, people staying overnight, and then there's obviously all the students from the Williams program that stay on the the seaport property. So the idea that uh, that there's a residential, and I hate to call it a residential use, but there's a there's a uh, there's people sleeping on the property overnight. That already exists. That's already going on. DEP's concern is you really shouldn't add that to a flood zone. And you know, the other elephant in the room is we are here following on the the the, the tail of the Smilers Wharf project, and I think the members of this commission can fully appreciate that this is completely different than Smiler's Wharf, which was re requesting a change from a purely water-dependent use, a marina, a boatyard, to a mixed use uh, that included totally new residential, and not just hotel space, but residential space, um, in a flood zone. Um, that's not what the seaport's doing here. The seaport is simply creating 27, or would create 27 uh, overnight accommodations on its property, a non-water dependent use, in an area of the seaport that already houses a non-water dependent use. The comments from deep seem to want to take the seaport and like break it up into little pieces and say, well, you're doing a really bad thing here. And it, I'm overstating it a little bit because you're putting a hotel you know, near the water. But we have to remember that that 100 feet or 150 feet of shoreline where Latitude 41 currently exists, that already houses a non-water dependent use. So we're not removing a water dependent use and adding something that wasn't there before. We are just redeveloping a non-water dependent use. The other thing that <coughs> Deep really missed out on is there's the bulkhead is there, and there's docks there. So the, the face of the bulkhead has a water-dependent use associated with it. Transient boaters tie up there, so it's a water-dependent use. It's dockage. It's berthing for boats. Um, that's not going to change with the redevelopment of the upland part of the Latitude 41 area of the seaport. And the seaport itself is is a water dependent use. You can't really be the preeminent maritime museum um, and not be considered a water dependent use. Excuse me for a second. Yeah. A thousand pardons, but no. have you heard from DEEP? Yes, there's a letter. We it's a comment today. That Was it in our package? I don't think so. I should say after that I need to into the record. Oh, okay. I didn't realize it didn't even come in. Sorry. That's. Um, I'm wondering if you this would be a good time to read that in, or do you want to continue full applicant proposal? Then, then it might give some context to my.
All right, so amendments to the master plan. The applicant seeks to construct two buildings to create a science and exploration center, demolish an existing restaurant on waterfront land, and an AE-10 flood zone and construct a multi-story 12-room hotel and restaurant, expand kitchen area, offer public access to a boat hall and the Rossi Mill, add a handicapped ramp, cat boat shed expansion, demolish gazebo, install solar panels, and relocate restrooms to the new hotel and restaurant building. The zoning district is Maritime Heritage District and is subject to an approved master plan for the entire site as a whole. The coastal site plan review will occur at a later time. We are generally supportive of the master plan amendments and site enhancements. However, we offer the following comments regarding the proposal for a new hotel with a restaurant on the flood-prone waterfront site currently occupied by the Latitude 41 restaurant. Citing a non-water dependent use on a waterfront site. While this waterfront site is currently occupied by the Latitude 41 restaurant on the Mystic Seaport campus, the applicant proposes to intensify this non-water dependent use at this waterfront site by also constructing a new multi-story hotel and restaurant closer to the water. While this proposal does not displace an existing water dependent use, it does have adverse impact on future water dependent uses on the site, which are defined by Section 22A93.17 of Connecticut General Statutes, which reads adverse impacts on future water dependent development opportunities and adverse impacts on future water dependent development activities include but are not limited to A, locating a non water dependent use on a site that one is physically suited for water dependent use for which there is a reasonable demand or two has been identified for water dependent use in the plan of development of the municipality or the zoning regulations. B replacement of a water dependent use with a non water dependent use and C siting of a non water dependent use which would substantially reduce or inhibit existing public access to marine or tidal waters. The site has a long history as a re recreated working seaport and regional tourist attraction. The Commission should determine whether adding a water dependent use such as a continuous waterfront walkway along the Mystic River would mitigate any adverse impacts to, water, to future water dependent uses appropriately. FEMA Flood Zone According to the latest FEMA maps, the site is designated AE-10 Flood Zone, not an AE-8 Flood Zone as indicated on the submitted plans. We urge the Commission to carefully consider the proposal to site a hotel on a flood prone site. The current building on site is a restaurant which does not house people. The Connecticut Coastal Management Act discourages development in the flood zones which would increase risks to people and property during flooding events. Specifically, the CCMA states that municipalities should manage coastal hazard areas so as to ensure that, developed, that development proceeds in such a manner that hazards to life and property are minimized. The town should consider creating a flood contingency plan that includes evacuation of hotel occupants during significant coastal storm events. Most of the Mystic Seaport is accessible to the general public and the venue is a major tur regional tourist attraction. While we appreciate the need of the Mystic Seaport for an on-site hotel and restaurant, we encourage consideration of an alternative location that is not a waterfront site in a flood zone. A hotel and restaurant use are not water dependent uses and the Town of Stonington's own plan of conservation and development discourages placing residential uses and new infrastructure in flood prone areas. By proposing to place the new hotel even closer to the water, the hotel will be even more susceptible to storm damage and less green space will be available to help storm water infiltrate on site. We recommend that the hotel be sited on another part of the campus which is not, a flood, which is not flood prone. This site does not have egress above the BFE to help evacuate hotel guests. Additionally, the loss of green space which currently abuts the Mystic River provides an area for stormwater to infiltrate rather than have fresh water be directly discharged into the Mystic River. View impacts. Placing a three-story hotel on a waterfront site closer to the water may adversely impact the public's view of the Mystic River from Route 27. The proposed building has more mass and height than the existing building and is being proposed closer to the water. The applicant should prepare a view shed renderings uh, to illustrate what water views will be available to the public at the time of coastal site plan review submittal. POCD conflicts. The Stonington Plan of Conservation and Development designates this particular waterfront site as institutional, which suits Mystic Seaport with its myriad of uses related to a recreated sea seafaring village. 
However, citing a hotel which is an accessory use serving the seaport and tourists on a flood-prone land is not in conformance with the town's own plan of conservation and development. It would seem to conflict with a number of provisions in the POCD text as follows. Section 325 states that the town will promote water-dependent uses in coastal areas. Waterfront sites suitable for water-dependent uses are scarce, and citing a hotel on this waterfront site removes another waterfront site from eligibility for our hosting a viable water-dependent use in the future. Section 332 states that the town will discourage new public infrastructure or development in flood-prone areas. The site, is the site is currently occupied by a restaurant, which is not a water-dependent use. By intensifying the usage of this flood-prone waterfront site and adding a hotel, this master plan amendment would allow new development in a flood-prone area and place people and property in harm's way. Section 325 states that the town will plan to adapt to the projected rise in sea level. However, this proposal to site a hotel on a waterfront lot closer to the water will place more people and property in harm's way. Placing a new hotel use in a flood-prone area is not adapting to sea level rise. Section 337 states that the town will restrict assisted living facilities, hotels, elderly, housing, and schools which have the potential to increase exposure of vulnerable populations in coastal flood hazard areas. This master plan amendment will allow the construction of a hotel in a coastal flood hazard area. Hotel guests are typically not from the area, nor are they familiar with the area, and in flooding events they would have to be evacuated. We hope that these comments are helpful to the Commission. We request that they be read into the record. Jeff Cayola, Assistant Director, Land of Re Water Resources Division, Bureau of Water Protection and Land Reuse. Thanks, Keith. So, yeah, thank you, Keith. Um, so while most of those comments relate to the hotel, or they all do, I, since we're previewing the projects, we might as well preview our response to those comments. So just a few things. Um, as we mentioned, we're not intensifying a use. It's the same use on the same piece of land. Um, actually, it's a smaller wedding, uh, sorry, a smaller restaurant, and based on the size of the banquet facilities, there'll actually be less weddings, where uh, Latitude 41 now can host two weddings at the same time, one inside, one outside. That won't be possible anymore. Um, as we mentioned earlier, the current building is about 215 feet from the river. The new building will be about 100 feet from the river. So it's, it's not like we're taking an upland building and we're moving it, you know, 1,000 yards closer to the water. It, it's in the same flood zone. It's just slightly closer to the river. Uh, it's a minor change and there's no increased risk. And um, the bottom line is, um, in terms of increasing, they're concerned about increasing risks to people and property. As Ken testified earlier, the current building is not flood compliant. If there really is a major storm, that building is going to be damaged. It's going to be flooded, first floor and the basement. The new building will actually result in less property damage because it'll be elevated above the base flood elevation. Also, in terms of planning for sea level rise, it'll be two feet above the base flood elevation. And we have to remember the base flood elevation isn't what happens once a month. It's the 100-year storm. It, it, it doesn't happen very often. And it doesn't happen immediately. Um, so it, they are planning for sea level rise. They're planning to build a flood-resistant building. Um, guess of the hotel. Uh, we, the reason, and I had this conversation with Jeff Kaola at DEP, um, citing residences in a flood zone is problematic because that's the person's home. Where do they go? Maybe they don't want to evacuate. Maybe they don't want to go to a shelter. So they shelter in place, leads to problems, then because the storm comes and they are surrounded. Well, hotel guests are hotel guests. They're transient. They have a home to go to. They're not wedded, you know, they're not trying to protect their hotel room from the flood <laughs> or their pets or, you know, their property. They can get in their car and drive away. 
So we, we think um, we're not really adding. The idea of putting a hotel here doesn't really add to any increase any, uh, to anyone's life or property. It actually minimizes it compared to the original or current building. I mentioned, I think I mentioned, you know, this whole idea of water dependent uses and non water dependent uses. It's, it's, it's the continuation of a non water dependent use. It's not removing any water dependent uses. And the site, to the extent that the seaport can do it, because their whole purpose is to encourage this connection with the sea, they have the docks along the waterfront. The hotel, um, in the preliminary, I won't say preliminary because they're further along than that, but in the discussions with their partner, would try to build upon the fact that there are docks right outside their back door uh, and incorporate that into the hotel and into the guest experience. Um, I can imagine if someone's going to take the time and expense to redevelop this property, there probably is going to be a very nice walkway along the river, especially when the fact that the town is creating a very uh, nice boat park immediately to the north of it that, and by chance, it's the same landscape architect working on both projects, that you might see some interconnectivity between the sites that is a benefit uh, to the public. But all those details will come in the future. Can I just ask a couple questions? Sure. So, um, as part of your feedback, it might, I would like to understand why you're just not tearing down latitude and putting it back where it is. Well, again, I'm not a landscape architect, but as, as um, Chad said, it's to open up the street front a little more. If you've been by latitude, you probably don't even yeah. notice it because this is what happens with land use, right? You, you show up somewhere and things are I the way they a are. a lot of things. Yeah, okay. and, yeah. and you, it's just the way it is. <laughs> But if you stop and look, at, for example, at, after the town got the park, if you, did you notice when they cut the top off the fence? Mm -hmm. It just opens it up. For years, all we had was just a wall. Well, right. there's still, and this is a lawyer talking, there's yeah. still, latitude is right up against the road. It blocks a lot of the view. If you push that whole building back and the, the boathouse, the, the fence goes away, that whole view of the river is actually going to be opened up. So moving it back 100 feet actually opens it up, ties it in with the Thompson building, and creates more of an opening um, plaza for the public. Did I say that right? Okay. For the record, Chad Frost is nodding his head. So that, that's why, rather than... Okay. And you mentioned <clears throat> that you felt, um, and, and it's true, that people come, they dock, they stay overnight, you have campers, you know, there are a lot of people who, you know, stay overnight in the museum, or in the seaport, but do they stay on the property, or do they stay on the boats that are on the water? All that, I think it's probably best if someone from the seaport testify to that. Steve? Steve White, Mystic Seaport, 95 Dolly Drive. Uh, most of the ch children that spend the night during the summer are on the Joseph Conrad, so they are indeed on a boat. Uh, the Williams Mystic students are staying in houses predominantly on the east side of Greenmanville Avenue. Right. Um, boaters, of course, are staying on their own boats. and. While I have the opportunity related to that, it's important for the Commission and the public to understand, and, and particularly DEP, that when hurricanes come, people come to Mystic Seaport by boat to leave their boats and stay on their boats during hurricanes because it's such a protected harbor. We don't get, we get, sea, we get water rise, but we don't get surge, we don't get waves. And so it's a very safe place to be on your boat and to protect your boat. And so uh, I, I think it's, it's ironic in a sense that when storms come, people come because it's safe. But most of the, uh, most of the children uh, that are spending the night are on either the Joseph Conrad or other boats. And there are no 
hotel rooms or overnight uh, guests staying at the current Latitude building, correct? That's correct. Even though it was once called Siemens Inn, right. okay. there were no overnight accommodations. Thank you. Will a hotel be open year-round? The vision is that it would be open year-round. And this is a question just for the general floor. I don't remember ever 27 being, Route 27 being flooded, meaning it would be a good evacuation route, but does 27 flood? It does flood. It's flooded during Sandy. It flooded during Irene at both of the stoplights. Both, of the, stop both of the parking lots uh, back in the day in the, in the 1800s uh, were marshlands. Right. So it might be hard to get to your car. Yeah. <laughs> True. Thanks for the clarification. Uh, just a one other point about the DEP's suggestion that the, the seaport put this somewhere else on its campus. Well, you can see I mean, two things from looking at the map is almost all of the campus is in a floodplain, so it would almost be impossible to put this somewhere else. And the rest of the campus, as Steve said earlier, it, that's their programming. Those are their exhibits. They'd have to take away part of their mission to put in a hotel. So they're not, they don't want to interfere with their basic mission. They're just trying to upgrade this one piece, you know, on the same site. So as the DEP's suggestion that you could put it somewhere else, it, it really wouldn't be appropriate on any other part of the property. Isn't there a zone issue about moving a restaurant across the street? And exactly, if you, if you move, yeah, you could, you, you're not supposed to put tourist-related right. elements of the seaport on the eastern side of Greenmanville. Yes. Um, a, a question for you. Um, if we were to approve what, you know, the whole however many projects, I've, I've yeah. lost count, uh, including this hotel, um, you can see, I mean, you can imagine that that's going to be used as a reason why we should approve a hotel further down the river, okay, in a flood zone. Uh, and, you know, I, Smiler's Wharf has been withdrawn, but, she, you know, as sure as we're sitting here, they'll be back, all right? So I was wondering if, and, and you're obviously not to the point where you can share details on this because... Mm -hmm. It's two or three years down the road, if, at least. If it wouldn't be um, easier to approve the rest of this if, if that portion of it were set aside for the time being. Well, so as d discussed earlier, if, if the commission was so inclined to uh, consider a motion to approve, if, if there was a stipulation in there that you know, projects one and two weren't provided with final master plan approval, that they had to come back for master plan approval on architectural details and site plan detail, as well as site plan approval. That is acceptable to the seaport. Uh, I was thinking a little more than that. Uh, so on the concept, if the question is as the to the concept of why is it okay to put a hotel in the flood zone here, and not down at exactly. And um, well, as a preliminary matter, I think you have to take each project individually. So, and I'm not here to argue against Smiler's War for the concept there. But what the seaport isn't doing is asking for a change of zone or a brand new master plan to allow uses that you know, didn't exist on the property. So while the a hotel where you go in to a front desk and get a key and go up to a room doesn't exist on the seaport currently, as Steve said, people come to the hotel, the kids come with their camping gear, they get on the, I'm gonna say Dunton, but Conrad, which yes, it's a boat, but it's, 
I don't know the last time it sailed. So 47. 47. So <laughs> maybe a bit like the QE2 tied up to the pier, a floating hotel, a floating hostel, maybe as a way to think about it. So they're overnight guests in a, on a boat tied up to a pier. It's, it's it, the use, that use, and you may say I'm splitting hairs, but that use exists on the seaport. People come and stay over. And we're not asking for the, the, the breadth and the expansive you know, development of Smiler's Wharf. I mean, this is you know, right now the concept being 27 rooms, um, much smaller impact. And we have to remember that there's nothing that says it can't happen. It, it's not prohibited. It's just a policy as to does it unreasonably elevate the risk to people and property if you put this in a flood zone. So with proper planning, uh, proper procedures, no one's life is going to be uh, put at risk by having 27 hotel rooms on a piece of property that used to have a restaurant on it and still has a restaurant on it. So that's, that's my... What does the word use mean, USE? You have to know the context, correct? Like you'd have to know what the agency defines the word as. Uh, the assessor's office may define it differently than the planning department does. The word use is used by a lot of different people. The word coastal flood hazard area is used differently by the town of Stonington than by the state of Connecticut. If you look at our plan of conservation and development, the section that they cited, 3.3.7, it says no hotel, they, the policy recommendation is to eliminate hotels and other such development in high hazard areas. But then if you actually go into the text of the POCD, because that section is just a summary of the text, it defines coastal high hazard areas as V zones. This property is not in a V zone, it's in an A zone. But when you look at the DEEP's classifications of what a high hazard area is for coastal flooding, they define it as both A and V. So when a technician from the DEEP reads our POCD without the full context, if they just look at 3.37, I'm not advocating, I'm pointing out a point of difference in definition here. And I think it's just important for you to recognize that uh, DEEP's definitions are a little bit different than what our definitions are in this, regular, in this uh, case. But you have no idea as to whether the person who reviewed the application did go into our, the context. Also, when, also. when, so I'm just clarifying, mm -hmm. as, you, as you said, is it, you have no idea if that person went into detail of our regulations, not just the summary top line, but down, and took that into uh, consideration when uh, reporting back. Well, so, if, I mean, if you I look at page 26 of the POCD, you'll see this language, and it says development in coastal flood ha hazard areas, and then in parentheses, it says V zones in our POCD should be restricted to prevent loss of life and property during major storm surges. I'm just putting that point of, of reference into the consideration here. So I don't need to know what they thought. I know what our regulations say. And then if you look at section 7.7.83 of our zoning code, it says coastal high hazard areas are V zones. That's all I'm point. I'm just pointing out that I think that there's a definitional difference between DEEP and, and the town. And I've, I've made that comment to DEP and they didn't respond to me. So, so Jason, so looking at the POCD 3.3.4, talks about the V-Zone flood zones. Separately, 3.3.7 talks about vulnerable populations and coastal flood hazard areas. For me, it's, it's kind of separate. And I think if you look at the deep letter and it talks about having an evacuation plan and talking about public safety, it's very important to note that we had Mr. White here present to us and testify that people are going to be coming to the hotel because that's what they do because it's a safe harbor. So 
it's almost against, it's against what they're recommending. Um, and I think when you talked about looking at them being housed on a boat, that's a questionable, they're not on land, so are they even on the zoned property or are they not on the zoned property? So is that a current use or is that not a current use? Just your phrase, not splitting hairs, but it's technically not on land. Two, just two things. So it does, ha people do stay over, but just want to make that point. And I think Steve wants to clarify. Well, I meant, I, I didn't say they would come to the hotel. I said they come on their boat and stay, stay on their boat. boat. Not to, because we don't have a hotel. They come now by boat because it's the safest harbor for them and for their boat during storms. But the assumption you sort of made was for them to have a place to stay is what I gathered from your comments. Because I don't know why we were commenting on people come there on their boat for safe harbor when we're talking about a hotel. I was just trying to make a point that it's a relatively safe river that yachtsmen consider a safe haven during a storm when other places may be uh, more at risk and that it's that if there were to be a place that is less risky on the water, it is one of the better places along this stretch of the coast. There was just a safety, a safety point. And on that we have, um, because we are a very large museum with a lot of assets and with a lot of people, we have a very sophisticated evacuation and, and a hurricane management system, uh, which I, I completely agree with DEP that if there were to be a residence in a structure like a hotel, that there'd have to be a very, very clear evacuation process that's very synonymous with the rest of our storm um, emergency response plan. Thank you. Any questions? Any other questions? Um, yeah, it, there's just a couple minor things on some of the staff comments that we, we concur with about some former lot lines uh, that were shown on plans. Those can be removed from um, any final plans. Uh, we agree, and we've already said that any new construction will comply with uh, flood hazard regulations and state building codes. Um, and we understand the WPCA's moratorium that prohibits any increase in flows to the Mystic uh, wastewater plant. And of course it adds a little complexity to this, but they've told us, and I think it's in the comments, that the only project on, in this application that would um, trigger that moratorium or be subject to that mor moratorium is the new hotel space. <laughs> so um, that's obviously something we'd have to contend with as well. But since we're not there yet, we again want to state for the record we understand it's a concern, an issue. Chairman, may I? Uh, there was a, a comment made earlier, uh, Ms. Conway, that I th think you said that we weren't anticipating to do anything with respect to the hotel for two or three years. Uh, that's not the case. If, if this project were to go forward, the idea would be to start the project in January of 2021. When we said two or three years, that was the, the temporary tent. I think that was Mr. Dykeman's comment. I'm sorry. Yeah, my mistake. Right. And I asked just also, yeah. <laughs> and also just to, to be clear, I, the GFOE, the, the Science and Exploration Center, would be back before you within months. The idea is that's going to be filed uh, by, uh, to be accepted at your September regular meeting. So these, you know, the partners, as you heard, the Seaports the, the partners are very excited to move these projects along. Can I just ask, so the, the, ocean, the ocean tank building, which was building one? Yeah. That, wouldn't have any effect on the sewage? Uh, us, I mean, where would you drain the tank if you needed to? I mean, how does that work? 
I'm going to ask Ken Wilson. The existing street sewer. I'm going to ask Ken Wilson to come up and answer that question. Oh. Sorry, could you repeat the question? What's the I impact mean, of the GFOE on um, the WPCA moratorium? So it's I've met with the WPCA with respect to GFOE. Yeah. If I get all the letters right, um, and at this point in time. Uh, they anticipate the sewage problem being resolved by the fall of 2020. Uh, GFOE would be occupying the building at about the same time. So their recommendation was that we proceed with the GFOE application at this point in time. In my conversations with them, we have an abundance of restroom facilities. The Seaport has about 67 restroom facilities across the property currently. So we, I had a very general discussion with them about swapping some restroom facilities out. So if the GOE, uh, GFOE facility needed to become operational before the moratorium was lifted, I could take other restrooms offline. And, and they were fine with that idea. I see. OK, thank you. Any other questions at this time? I, I just have two more questions. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, because it came out in um, the DEP report. So um, the, the restaurant hotel, how close is it to the water? You said it was 100 to 115 feet closer than latitude, but how close would it be to the water, the back patio, or just in general? Yeah, by my measurement, Google Earth, it, it's about 100 feet. So it's 100 feet close, okay. And then, you know, I, don't, and you have mentioned this, a lot of boats come in, public access, they, they dock for the day or, you know, for a moment. Um, would that in any way change the number of boats or the area or, you know, with any kind of landscaping or boardwalk or whatever that proposal would be, would that either increase or decrease public access to the, um, you know, the ability to dock your boat, whatever, the public, to the public. Oh, sorry. So the seaport doesn't actually have slips per se right, in the right, sense right, of a marina. Yeah. So we have we have bulkhead frontage, yeah. and we have about fourteen hundred lineal feet of dockable mm -hmm. bulkhead frontage. So it's really a function of the size of the boats that count. You could have 35, 40 foot boats or 40, 35 foot boats. Mm -hmm. So we're not giving up any dockage with respect to the hotel. It, the dockage remains the same. Okay, thank you. You're not adding nor deleting any dock space. That's, that is correct. Okay, thank you. Take a 10 minute recess. Calling those who have signed up to speak in favor, um, Peggy Roberts. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Peggy Roberts. I'm the president of the Greater Mystic Chamber of Commerce. I'm also a resident of Stonington, 11 Joy Avenue. And uh, we are neighbors of the Mystic Seaport Museum. We're right across the street. Our offices are on uh, Route 27, right there across the street where we have our welcome center. So um, we consider them one of the most important economic drivers, a pillar of this community. And to support improvements there are, is very important to us and to all of Mystic. So we see this project as an economic driver that's important for the future, for the future of all of our businesses and our members at the chamber. We think the hotel and restaurant will be an attractive upgrade for weddings and events that bring many visitors, tourists to, to, uh, to Mystic. And we know that this area is becoming an increasingly big destination wedding location. Um, the Greenwich Hospitality Group has an excellent reputation. We think it would be a great partner and would put a, a great facility in that we could all be proud of. I like, I personally like the fact that uh, the building would be moved back from 27 because it would allow for traffic to pull off the street. And if you go by there, as I do every day, you often see 
people stopped right there by the curb on 27 when there's traffic trying to come and go and it's pretty awkward so that would be a really good thing if we could move traffic off the off 27 into that circle um, I, th I think that someone pointed out the collaboration with the Boathouse Park would also be great. I think it would um, enhance our um, offerings to tourists in the area. And um, we like the idea of also creating, uh, addressing the issue of the intersection at Route 27 and Rossi Park Pentway, um, which, which is a little bit unsafe and needs to be looked at. So that's, there are many, many reasons. I know there's still some things up in the air. Um, we will definitely be back when you talk about the, the remaining issues on the table, but I just want to reiterate that the seaport is so important to us in Mystic. It's important to this economy, and we should all be supporting them as much as possible. Thank you very much. Does anyone else like to speak in favor of his application? Um, those opposed, James Tennant. Hello, everybody. My name is James Tennant. I'm at Six Hinkley Street. Um, I'm on the border to the seaport um, with two properties that I own. Uh, I also own three other properties in Mystic. Um, I'm, I have a number of concerns uh, about the hotel and, and other issues um, but let me I, I, I'm, uh, I'll try to uh, <laughs> organize my thoughts here uh, I was a, uh, a principal in negotiating uh, the establishment of the, uh, the MHD when it was first uh, uh, just a concept uh, so I've got a lot of uh, uh, interest in what goes on in my particular neighborhood um, now, uh, let's see. I'm, I'm, I was always concerned with increased commercialization coming down in 27, and this just seems to be uh, another increase as far as the hotel itself is concerned, hotel center. Um, now, the hotel regulations, when they were first established, Um, when the, the MHD regulations were first established, uh, the neighbors were concerned about overnight staying uh, on the seaport grounds. And in the regulations themselves, uh, but this is specific to the Rossi Mill, uh, they, the, the regulations state that there will be no overnight accommodations. Now, uh, at that time, we weren't considering a hotel uh, on the property. Uh, on the, the, the western side of Route 27, but that be, that's become an issue now. Um, I don't think the neighborhood really wants to have overnight accommodations, and um, the purpose of having a hotel over there, I assume, is for profit. It's not, it doesn't have anything to do with uh, uh, the seaport's mission. Um, now, uh, if a hotel is approved, which I wouldn't want to see, um, would certainly be concerned with a 45 foot height. Uh, the design of the, the building uh, in the regulations uh, should conform to the character of the neighborhood, uh, which the, uh, the Thompson Center doesn't. Uh, I don't know how that got by, but it did. Um, also with the, uh, uh, the hotel, uh, the driveway or the easement that is owned by the town, uh, maybe you can answer this question for me, does that easement el uh, eliminate the, the town's ability to use that property in conjunction with the, with the new park? Or does the park, uh, will the park be able to use that, uh, that piece of property to access uh, the new park? Um, And the curb cut uh, uh, that they plan on using right now uh, is probably 100 feet away from the traffic light. Now that's going to cause more congestion uh, coming into that intersection. Uh, it, if this was to be approved, I, I, would, I would think that they would try to, uh, 
try to adjust uh, uh, the traffic so that it would it would go it would have to go into the traffic light and be controlled by the traffic light, um, but it's still going to increase that uh, the congestion. I mean, it's already you can all wear it. It's already bad. <laughs> uh, let's see, going on. Uh, four bucks. That's something else. Oh. And that's pretty much all we have to say about the hotel. Um, as far as the science and exploration center is concerned, uh, they didn't mention anything about access and egress. Is that going to uh, uh, increase any uh, uh, traffic into the neighborhoods? Uh, are uh, any openings going to be placed or the existing opening on Bruggeman, is that going to be used uh, for access and egress? Uh, that would be a concern. Uh, and I did note that um, you're considering not uh, approving uh, uh, the hotel this evening uh, with this uh, application, and I'd appreciate it if you did that. Um, that would give us more time to uh, to hash out the the problems that uh, that exist. Um, now the tent, uh, I wasn't really aware of where that tent was going to go. It seemed. Uh, to me, a little bit uh, um, vague. Is that to, is that tent to be to remain? Is that to remain? Uh, uh, yeah, but you talked about moving it. Is that to remain behind the Rossi Mill, uh, or are you talking about moving it somewhere else? Oh, as far as the possible wheel, yeah. Just um, well, my my comment to that was that just so it can be less in sort of the face of the houses there, if they could just be moved a bit to the south, you know, so sort of moving it over here. Oh, okay, it would remain in the back, but you're moving it uh, away from, away from Hinkley Street? Is that the way uh, I see it? Yeah, this is Hinkley, right? Uh, away from no, the street. That, that would be uh, Velvet Lane, Vel it? Yeah, that's Velvet. Yeah, so you're talking about moving it over toward, closer to Hinkley Street. With that, uh, uh, you're not planning on disrupting bus parking in that area, are you? Well, it was just a, it was just basically a question I had for the seaboard: is could it be relocated over here? Why? So, what would be your train of thought? In that just regard? so it would be less visible to the houses on Velvet Mill, on Velvet Lane. Okay, I guess that's pretty much all I have to say about uh, this application, but uh, if I could uh, just state a few things about uh, 4 Rossi Street, the previous application. Now that's in the MHD zone. Uh, I own a property directly across the street. I didn't hear anything about this until I walked in tonight about having a, a bluegrass venue. Um, in a residential neighborhood. Now, I don't know whether it's just well, going to be a practice quiet type of thing, or is it going to be a, a you know, a, a party, a, a party venue or what? I mean, there was nothing stated about it. And I don't appreciate the fact that you guys went ahead and approved this thing without the neighbors having the opportunity to, to understand what actually was going to happen and have input. And they, they're supposed to have input. Well, that, uh, the application, it was really, it was just a garage for a single family house. So the studio was just the owner's home music studio for his own practice. It was not a music venue or anything like that. Okay, um, well, it, there wasn't a public hearing requirement like there was for this, which is a master plan amendment, but it had to come back to the commission. Usually, a, you know, a single family house building a garage doesn't need to go to the commission at all. But in this case, it, it did, but it didn't have the same notice requirements as this. Well, it's in the MHD zone, and that states that, it's, that it has to have notification requirements. I disagree. For, for anyway, a master plan amendment, the regulations do say for a small thing like that, it can be done through their administrative uh, review process, okay, which they well, did earlier. 
there was no uh, no stipulations placed on this. So, what can happen now? Yeah, it's basically the same as any single family house where, well, and frankly, in my house, I have sort of a music studio in my house, which is in the venue. It's just sort of for doing musical things that don't bother anybody. <laughs> okay, well, I hope that's the case. You're going to surprise a lot of neighbors if it isn't. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, there is a town ordinance regarding nuisance if, you know, he blasts music at three in the morning or something like that. Oh, yeah, no, I'm aware yeah. of that. Typical of any of any house in town. Ten o'clock at night, though. Thank you very much, everybody. Mary Henderson. So I'm Mary Hendrickson, and I live at, I live at 20 Rossi Street. Um, so I went to the neighborhood meeting that the Seaport had. I also went to um, a meeting that was held about two weeks ago at the police department for some commission. I'm not exactly sure. And what I got out of, of this is that there's a lot of ifs, and uh, so... The biggest if for me right now is the traffic situation that we have um, in our neighborhood. Uh, you know, Route 27, Seaport Heights all goes down to Route 27. And last week, I think it took us about 45 minutes to get to the highway. Um, so I'd like to just... Um, the other thing was that from these other meetings, I was like super confused about should there be the hotel, there was some sort of a circular entrance, um, which would be the drop off the zone. But it seemed as though the entrance would come in from the boathouse um, and then there would be another way to get out. It was super ambiguous to me. So, um, we haven't seen the completed plans for the boathouse. We haven't seen the plans for the hotel or at these other <laughs> meetings, they called it the hospitality center um, or the restaurant. Um, it all seems to be conjecture, but what's not conjecture is the traffic challenges we have on Route 27. Traffic is at a standstill on the summer weekends when there's no let up between the south parking lot, the Rossi Pentway light, and the light near the highway. So the risk, um, I think the town has to seriously consider challenges of entering and exiting the park, the, the boathouse park, as well as the entrance and exit to this new hotel, quote, hospitality restaurant that the seaport is presenting. Um, we don't know what the projected traffic flow um, is going to be for the town boathouse park site. Uh, we don't know about this guest drop-off center, hospitality center, but we can imagine that it's going to be a lot different and much more intense than the current commercial deliveries to the Latitude restaurant. Um, the circular drop-off for the proposal is going to have to it's going to be more frequent because it's going to be used from morning to the evening and if there is an entrance around there doesn't it seem to be more logical that it's directly across from uh, Rossi Pentway when the town com uh, when the town park is completed there's going to be a steady flow of cars um, for at least three seasons during the year and as long as there are parking spaces available at the park site, cars are just going to be coming and going. Um, further, what happens when the seaport site has a large event, like a wedding, at the same time, and maybe something's happening at the park, like a high school regatta. A few weeks ago, there were four events going on between the south, south parking, lot, um, parking lot and Latitude restaurant. There was a large wedding being held at Latitude. There was a concert at the Quad at the, quad, um, at the seaport. Um, the antique wooden boat people were showing off their boats, and the German club was having a heavy metal concert. 
all that sound was going on. It was a weird combination of noise from our front porch. And I can only imagine the traffic scene. I didn't leave because when I hear that kind of stuff, I just like shelter in place, right? You just don't go anywhere. So if plans are not collaborated, this is the kind of thing that can happen. Um, so why is the seaport incorporating the boathouse property into their plan? And, this, and the seaport should incorporate the daily access to their proposed hotel, hospitality center, restaurant, um, the, the, you know, from the cut at Rossi Pentway. Um, so I just think all that stuff has got to be figured out a lot. Um, I agree um, with the DEEP, the boutique hotel is in a flood, zo flood zone. Um, I'll make a correction to the Mystic Seaport. Um, it's within the Mystic Bridge National Regist Register District, but it's also in the Rossi Mill National Register District. It's within two National Register Districts. Um, I agree that I'm very worried about the proposed height of the hotel. And I think we need to understand that the Mystic River Basin is basically uh, a heritage view. And that's what people love about uh, Mystic. And we even have the overlook on I-95 Look, you know, looking at this view, that was what drew me to the to the area. So, will the will the hotel um, where it's proposed block the view? Um, and you know, maybe it is better if it's closer to the road. You know, um, I think that's something that really should be looked at uh, because it could be that if the building's really big. The people in a hotel are going to have a great view of the Mystic River Basin, but how about the people from the boat park and other areas around Mystic? It's, you know, it might turn out to be a big block in the way. Um, so I question, I question the concept of a full site approval tonight because I don't think there's enough detail. Um, and let's see. Um, and I agree that the hotel should be very thoughtfully considered that we wouldn't want it to be a precedent for other areas of the town, which Fred mentioned. So um, thank you very much. Strassi, whoever pronounced our name before. <laughs> Hi, I am Joan Ballastrassi, and I live at 20 Hinckley Street, and I absolutely do love the Mystic Seaport. I'm 80 years old. I grew up here. I stayed. I actually went on the Brilliant, out on the Brilliant, so that shows you how long I've been here. So I do love the seaport, and I love the concept of the seaport. However, the reason I'm here tonight is I absolutely am adamant against the hotel. I have with, we live on the Stonington side of Mystic. There are eight hotels now on this side of Stonington. One is not even being used and it has a restaurant. You get off 95, it's right there and nobody seems to make that work. A, a hotel Three stories up, you have to worry about the sewage. I know it's in moratorium, I know that. But you're going to have extra laundry. you got the laundry to do now that you did not have before. I also know that as far as the latitudes go, I actually had three weddings of my family there this year, and the food, everything was wonderful. One of them was right out on the point, and it was absolutely beautiful. So I think not offering that, it's very hard for brides, because I know that, hard for them to find a place to have a venue as beautiful as Latitudes. So it is important to still keep something along that line. But I see no reason for another hotel. If there is one, why couldn't it be like the Tabor Inn? That's keeping with Mystic. It's low, it's very, um, 
I don't know, it kind of keeps with the old-fashioned seaport to me along, if they did something along that line. And we don't need another boutique in town. We got enough of those around as it is also. Um, the other thing is, I agree with Mary, it takes us on a Sunday afternoon 25 to 35 minutes to get to 95, which is a five-minute ride to get to the turnpike. No one, the light's red, no one lets you out. The only seaport worker that ever let us out was Rhoda, and everybody knows Rhoda. She was the only one that ever let us out. Most seaport workers, when they go to work in the morning, here's my car. They'll take your fender off to get to work. People should get to work early on time, not run in at the last minute. They never let us out. And that's for a lot of us on our street. We all have that same problem. Other than that, I'm all in favor of everything the seaport has done, but I am not in favor of um, a big hotel. I don't think we need more, another hotel. If we do have something one layer, I mean, we have, we have no view from our home now. And as far as the orange signs go, I feel like I live near Home Depot. So I feel all these different things of adding a three-story building to make a hotel, orange signs like Home Depot, has devalued our property. And thank you. Uh, ben Dansky, Mr. Connecticut. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. We're here again this evening talking about a significant development proposal for a prominent and important waterfront site. The Connecticut DEEP has weighed in on this application, uh, and I would like to read from their comments. I know they've been read into the record, but um, since most of you haven't even seen them, I would like to reiterate a couple of points. Um, so reading from the DEP, Citing a non-water dependent use on a waterfront site, while this waterfront site is currently occupied by the Latitude 41 restaurant on the Mystic Seaport campus, the applicant proposes to intensify this non-water dependent use at this waterfront site by also constructing a new multi-story hotel and restaurant closer to the water. While this proposal does not displace an existing water dependent use, it does have an adverse impact on water de future water dependent uses on this site, which are defined by section 22A-9317 of the Connecticut General Statutes, particularly A, locating a non-water dependent use at a site, number one, that is physically suited for a water dependent use for which there is a reasonable demand, and two, has been identified for water dependent use in the plan of conservation and development of the municipality. Um, Going to the FEMA flood zone, we urge the commission to carefully consider the proposal to site a hotel on a flood prone site. Um, we, the current building site, the current building on site is a restaurant which does not house people. The Connecticut Coastal Management Act discourages development in flood zone, which would increase risks to people and property during flooding events. Specifically, the CCMA states that municipalities should, quote, manage coastal hazard areas so as to ensure that development proceeds in such a manner that hazards to life and property are minimized. While we appreciate the need of the Mystic Seaport for an on-site hotel and restaurant, we encourage consideration of an alternative location that is not a waterfront site in a flood zone. A hotel and restaurant use are not water dependent uses and the town of Stonington's own plan of conservation and development discourages placing residential uses and new infrastructure in flood prone areas. By proposing to place the new hotel even closer to the water, the building will be even more susceptible to storm damage and less green space will be available to help storm water infiltrate on site. We recommend that the hotel be sited on another part of the campus which is not flood prone. This site does not have egress above the BFE to help evacuate hotel gas. Additionally, the loss of the green space which currently abuts the Mystic River provides for an area for storm water to infiltrate rather than have fresh water be directly charged into the Mystic River. 
Uh, Planet Conservation and Development Conflict, Section 3.2.5, states that the town will promote water-dependent use in coastal areas. Waterfront sites suitable for water-dependent uses are scarce, and siting a hotel on this waterfront site removes another waterfront site from eligibility for hosting a viable water-dependent use in the future. Section 3.3.2 states that the town will discourage new public infrastructure or development in flood-prone areas. The site is currently occupied by a restaurant which is not a water-dependent use. By intensifying the usage of this flood-prone waterfront site and adding a hotel, this master plan amendment would allow new development in the flood-prone area and places people and property in harm's way. Section 3.2.5 states that the town will plan to adopt to the projected sea rise in sea level. However, this proposal to site a hotel on a waterfront lot closer to the water will place more people and property in harm's way. Placing a new hotel use in a flood-prone area is not adopting to adapting to sea level rise. Section 3.3.7 states that the town will restrict assisted living facilities, hotels, elderly housing, and schools which have the potential to increase exposure of vulnerable populations in coastal flood hazard areas. This master plan amendment will allow the construction of a hotel in a coastal flood hazard area. Hotel guests are typically not from the area, nor are they familiar with the area of flooding events that they would, from which they would have to be evacuated. Um, so, there are two points that are important to consider uh, with the placement of the hotel in this location. One is the idea of placing a hotel in a flood zone, which violates the CCMA or CAM Act and our own POCD. I realize that the staff report would lead you to believe that the restriction of hotels in a flood hazard zone only refers to V zones, but that reading is not supported by the language in the table 3.3.7 nor is it supported by the Connecticut Coastal Management Program fact sheet for coastal hazard areas, which I believe in, is in your packet. You probably got it with a letter from the DEP, and I'll read from that. Um, coastal flood, area, flood hazard areas include all areas designated as within A zones and V zones by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA. A zones are subject to still water flooding during so-called 100-year flood events. During 100-year flood events, V zones are subject to direct action by waves three feet or more in height. Um, the second point from the DEP, uh, again on the hotel, is the placement of a non-water dependent use on the waterfront, and I would emphasize particularly this waterfront. The rest of the seaport property really epitomizes what a water dependent use is, and it would be short-sighted on your part, and indeed on the part of the applicant, to not consider future water dependent uses at this location. Also, I would claim that there's already a water dependent use at this location, which is dockage and access to the museum that exists at this section of the waterfront. Um, and in fact, I was there by boat last night to take a look at it. And there is a dock there along the bulkhead. And there is dockage, and it's mostly small boats and dinghy access and so forth. And um, I know I've used it for myself for events like the wooden boat show and um, the antique and classic boat meet. Um, it, it is access for small boats to get in. And, uh, so I would, let's see, I would urge you to consider the negative impact on traffic that this proposal would create. This is already a very difficult location in the busy months without traffic exiting and entering from the west side of Route 27. I can only imagine the nightmare that will ensue with the addition of parking access and egress from this side of the highway. And amazingly, they've asked for a waiver of a traffic study. I, I don't know how that, how they can ask for that. Um, so I strongly urge you to deny the placement of a hotel at this location. There are certainly better locations for it, perhaps even within the seaport property. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve Hobake at 19 Velvet Lane. Uh, I'm going to limit my comments to the tent. Our house is at the end of Velvet Lane, and I, uh, Steve White um, gave a presentation a couple weeks ago. So th these are my thoughts on the tent. If you approve it, I would like language. Some, somebody suggested putting uh, a time frame for this tent in the if it's approved in the approval language, so I think that's uh, an excellent thought. Um, I understand it was going to be there for two or three years from 2020, so wording to that effect. The second thing I'd like 
in any approval wording is this tent is for storage only and not work. And uh, the third thing I would like, I, I, we would like, I would like to see the tent less visible. It's supposedly 35 feet high, and I'll just uh, leave it at that. I'm not sure uh, it can be made shorter. I heard uh, somebody on your commission, Keith, mention about moving it to the south. Uh, Steve White mentioned that. Um, so th those are my three thoughts on the tent, and that's. I had other comments about the hotel, but you're not approving it. You're going to have a future public hearing, and I'll talk about that um, later. Thank you. Jessica Morrissey, she left. Yeah. Anyone else like to speak tonight? I had not signed up yet. My name is James Short. I live on Denison Avenue, I have for about 45 years. The only thing I'd like to speak to is to consider traffic. The boathouse project and this are really right against each other and need to be thought of in the traffic area, need to be thought of as an overall picture. And I would think having the, having the um, restaurant hotel traffic line up on the light is a is a much better idea uh, we've uh, we've got we've added curb cuts on 27 uh, we've got the, the nature center out there now the old Coogan farm you know we added the daycare center out there the sea view is very popular kitchen little is an ice cream shop very popular right when people are going home and traffic is heavy left turns in and out of that area are really bogging things down. <clears throat> so I honestly think that the boathouse would be better off if they used the existing curb cut, rework their parking, and just get rid of the other curb cut, put everything in at the traffic light to route to the hotel. I think it would just work much better and that's it. I'll get out. Uh, my name is Nancy Evans, Old Mystic, Stonington Side, 35 year resident. We earn our living or earned our living in the maritime business, and I am an environmentalist. There are a number of issues that I hope you will address. First of all, I think we're reworking this whole thing again, putting a hotel in a flood zone moving it back and taking 150 feet of drainage. Right now, we just heard that the restaurant is being pumped out because the basement is continually flooded. What part of coastal sea level rise is not getting through to our planning? This is happening. River Road is continuously wet, no matter what the tide level. So you're, you're talking about putting a hotel, which is a for-profit residence, believe it or not, it's not sitting on a boat which floats, goes up and down with the tide, and, hotel, and homes for the Mystic Williams project, which are already there. You know, they're, they're just like the neighbors. They know about that. So I don't think a for-profit is a great idea. I know we're not addressing that. But I find this application a little bit more loosey-goosey than what an unsettling, I love the fact that they're saying, you know, we want to be up front. This is what we're thinking. This is where we want to go. I like to see it a little bit more hard edge. These are the things we need to do on our campus to make it work well. And before I go any further, I have to say, I am so proud of Mystic Seaport. I don't know if anybody else has been reading the fact that the Tate Gallery has allowed 
the only place in North America to show Turner paintings is Mystic Seaport. They are unbelievably important to us. So we need to make a lot of effort to make sure that they're able to function and to be able to pay their bills and to work out. Hotel, not a good idea. Hotel in a floodplain, are you out of your mind? What about the research center? You're going to drop a 20-foot tank into an already flooded ground? It, it floods so heavily on 27, it's been above my waist on some of those tides and some of those, you know, in, influxes from Irene, Sandy, in the 2010 disaster above us. So, so you, can't, you just can't do that. It's just not appropriate. It has to be now to the point where you're adapting. You're adapting to preserve this for another 90 years. You know, I wonder to myself, I'm thinking about this. I drive down 27 a lot, and it's taking your life in your hands. It, the traffic is, is incredible. People are distracted. You put this hotel in. Oh, I'm not going to even go to the hotel because I just can't conceive of it. But what about if we put the science center there, the research part? Why don't we build a really attractive building and turn it into another world-class effort to work with the water and you know the underwater research that's coming and make it another draw for the seaport? Low impact as far as traffic, incredible, you know, publicity worldwide. Why not? You want to have this? Start it up. Use your head. Build up something really special and make it better. But building tanks into the water in a flooded area, putting a for-profit residential hotel, I don't know. And, and then taking up all that. It, you know, I hear this. It's only 150 feet, 150 feet of drainage, which naturally helps the flooding. You know, one last thing, and I know it's not appropriate, but Ethiopia just planted 350 million trees in 12 hours because they are trying to save their country. This is what's happening in the world. We're very naive if we're going to build up our, our tax base for a 10-year window of opportunity. We need to be a little bit more creative, a little bit more face the reality of what's happening, and that's, that's it. I know I got off on a long stretch, but it's important. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak? You almost missed it. Good evening. <laughs> I wasn't going to speak, but I had a couple of questions uh, while I was sitting here this evening. Uh, Jim Stanton, 46 Masons Island Road. Um, I was wondering if the new venture, the new building, the hotel would be planning on paying property taxes to the town, and maybe I should address that to the seat. I think that's kind of important, although it doesn't seem like there's hundreds of people here, uh, you know, looking to argue over that point tonight, but it, it would be nice to, to see that because it's going to put some more pressure on the town services and so forth. So as I looked at the map, I was wondering uh, if somebody would explore the idea of possibly working with the boathouse project in order to have a common driveway that exits with the red light because I think that in a normal traffic time you can't get in and out of either site right now nobody's driving to a Siemens Inn I still call it Siemens Inn sorry um, so there's no traffic that way and there's very little right now but eventually we're gonna have mothers and fathers and teenagers I have two 16 and 18 I'm not happy to drive with them so I can't imagine unloose, loosing 20 of them at a time out the driveway there, you know, and uh, I'm lucky because I can go down Hewitt, down Pequot Seapost and get on the highway and not go down Route 27. People complain about the traffic. I said, you can avoid it unless you live in downtown, then you can't. But if you live on the outskirts, you can, you can avoid the traffic. But thinking about other people, I, I think we, you know, got to really look at this carefully. 
I think a lot of people are going to be using that park even when it's closed if they can drive in their park or you know use it they're going to be in and out of there a lot and if the hotel goes in uh, there'll be people driving there and trying to park in front of the hotel and walk in and go to sleep so uh, that's that's another problem but I mean if they if they didn't have the driveway up to the front of the hotel that would eliminate a lot of problems but it probably doesn't work that well for the hotel so I'm hoping that they can utilize that red light which is so close and there are so many cars piled up there at so many different times of the day or night now and uh, like that other lady uh, commented earlier the first lady those orange signs they are they're not good <laughs> they don't look like mystic but I'm pretty sure the designer doesn't live around here and you know I'm hoping that they age those signs out come in with some like blue and gold or green and gold and make it look like really old New England but uh, other than that I'm a very happy customer of the seaport and my kids grew up going to the uh, Children's Museum we spent many happy hours there thank you For the record, <clears throat> John Casey Robinson and Cole representing the applicant. Uh, I'll try to I'll try to be quick. Sorry, there's an echo. <clears throat> On the question of uh, traffic and the waiver, so we did ask for a, a waiver of a traffic study for this application. I, I think the commission understands, but I just want to make it perfectly clear. Any new prod when the big projects come back, uh, I think it would be acting at our peril if we ask for a waiver of a traffic study at that point. So there will be uh, a complete traffic study and it, it, it doesn't escape the, um, uh, the powers that be at the seaport or its development partner with the hotel or the boat park committee, uh, which Steve White is a member of, that the two projects are right next to each other and they're going to have to work in concert uh, in order to uh, make sure that the traffic and the entrances, people coming on and off Route 27 uh, can do that safely. There will also be um, interactions with the Office of State Traffic Authority. It is a state road. There's existing curb cuts but they'll have a, stay, a say in, in how the traffic is, is handled there. And we'll be able to present you with uh, real data about um, the anticipated number of cars coming in and off the property, as I assume the boathouse people will, sorry, the boat park people will as well. So we won't be dealing with um, you know, speculation about you know, how bad this is going to make everything we'll have an expert testify as to exactly what the anticipated impacts are. Um, most of the other comments concern the hotel and, and we've acknowledged here that that's going to come back. Um, regarding the tent, there was a couple of comments. I, I, I think the bottom line for us there is We'll do what the staff or the commission feels is best. I, I have a question on the tent. Yes. Could you lower and in some of that space make it longer but lower? Let me uh, refer yeah. that to, to Ken Wilson because it, it's an existing structure. I know. Yep. So unfortunately, <clears throat> John is correct. It is an existing structure. It was designed to cover the Mayflower. So the Mayflower has a specific length and width and height associated with it. The height of the, of the tent, the current tent, is in two pieces. So that's why we were able to take the one section out. But the base section that needs to remain is the rail section that attaches to the foundation. And then the balance of it is the curve of the roof itself. So the 12 foot section that I referred to earlier is the only section that can come out. In so addition what, to one of the blocks on the sorry, foundation. Just give me information here. What would be the total height of that with the with a section out? 30, uh, 35 feet, 35, feet. 35 to 33, depending if I can get both blocks out of the foundation. 
And that would be up from date? Uh, Twenty twenty to twenty twenty two. Three years, two to three years, maximum. Two to three years, right. Two years. Three years. Two to three. Two to three years. Two years. Okay. Thank you. Um. Uh, John Casey again for the record. I just, um, not to beat a dead horse, but um, in, in terms of the DEP comments and the impact on future water-dependent uses, I, I just want to be clear that, as I said, the seaport itself is one big water-dependent use. Um, this would, you know, it's not quite the same, but latitudes like the, you know, like the food stand at a marina. You know, it's just, it's a part of the entire uh, experience at the seaport. It's very gratifying to hear people come and you know, talk about how much they love the seaport and all it does for the community. But we have to remember, it, it all works together, each part. They need latitude to be able to, to uh, raise revenue, to help pay for other parts of the seaport. They need all their property to be working as efficiently as possible in order to have things. We wouldn't have, and I wasn't aware of this exchange with the Tate Gallery, but we wouldn't, I don't think we would have that if the seaport wasn't able to uh, be financially um, stable. And in order to do that, as Steve said when we started, they need to continually evolve and, and be able to provide the best programming. So this is all part of that process of moving forward. There's, there's going to be different uses. Everything can't be just boats at the seaport. So you're going to need a restaurant. You're going to need a gallery, galley. You're going to need uh, spaces like GFOE to make the whole thing work together. And just quickly on, on GFOE, the, the way the regulation is written, um, those research facilities are supposed to be on the eastern side of Greenmanville Avenue where the tourist-related act activities are supposed to be on the western side. So taking a large chunk of the parcel that's supposed to be related to tourists, whether it's a restaurant or an exhibit space, we can't put that on the eastern side because the reg doesn't allow it. There was one comment about no overnight accommodations, and, and that's specific to Rossi Mill. But the concept when this district was created was that you keep the tourist related activities on the western side and the research, administration, parking on the eastern side. And that's just what we're trying to do. We're not trying to totally rearrange all the, all the deck chairs on the, uh, on the ship here. In terms of development of any new buildings, they'll, uh, the DEP comment about green space and infiltration um, the plan is to maximize the amount of impervious surface on the latitude 41 parcel when it's redeveloped to the greatest extent possible. Pervious. Yeah, sorry, I got that wrong. <laughs> maximize impervious surfaces to the greatest extent possible. Um, there's a lot of pervious space on that parcel now with the big building. Um, and as I said before, since your regs require the handling of stormwater to you know, best management practices, that's going to be presented to you. Currently now, there's no real stormwater management system on that property. So anything that goes there is going to be an improvement because they're going to start to incorporate roof drains, dry wells, and anything like that, whatever works on the site. So. I think my last point is, is just to circle back to this idea about the use of the, the Mystic Seaport property 
and we would just, um, we know we're not asking for specific approval tonight, but just the concept that uh, certain uses, including overnight accommodations, have been ongoing at the seaport, and all that we're asking is that they be allowed to continue, different form, but same use, as well as these non-water dependent uses. The, there's restaurants already on the property. Uh, all we ask is that they be continued to be allowed, and we don't feel, and again, this will come later, but you know, adding a floor, we know there's going to be a whole issue as to the design of the building, but the concept of adding some hotel rooms, a non-water dependent use to an existing non-water dependent use uh, is not, there's no restriction, there's no prohibition to that. Um, and as Steve pointed out, the seaport already has extensive um, safety plan for in times of storms. So we don't think there's any increased risk to any persons or property that will occur if a new hotel is put on the property. So with that, I will end it. I will ask you, just to be clear, what we're asking for tonight is to approve the application as proposed for the 10 projects, numbers 2 through 10, 2 through 12, sorry. Um, specific. No, three. Three. 3 through 12, sorry. Um, see, it's even bad for us. Um, 3 through 12, uh, as presented in the application, full master plan approval so that the seaport can uh, go forward confidently that those projects can be done. Those that will need site plan approval will come back for site plan approval. And then the two big projects that need additional master plan approval and site plan approval will come back on their own. Thank you. Well, thanks. One of the things I want to um, just bring the commission's attention to is just to go back to the statement of purpose of the Maritime Heritage District because Basically, all the decisions you make in this zone have to sort of come back to that, um, which is just to quickly read that. The zone's intended to permit museum, tourism, historical, cultural, and educational uses that preserve and enhance the town's historic character while providing opportunities for exploring the maritime heritage of the nation. The zone's intended to allow for the establishment, continuation, and expansion of such uses and activities in ways that will maintain and enhance compatibility with surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, and it goes on to list certain factors, um, such as compatibility with the POCD um, and other things that were talked about, like having the tourist-related activities on the west side of Greenmanville and other less intense things on the east side. Um, excuse me. Well, we sent this application to different uh, boards and commissions and agencies for comment. Um, the town engineer just brought out the future need for stormwater assessment, um, flood hazard compliance, WPCA. We talked about uh, the moratorium and um, how the hotel would fall into the moratorium, wouldn't be allowed uh, yet at this time. Police commission um, basically felt there wasn't enough information to comment and wanted to see more detail as far as a traffic study and um, you know, they were concerned with the traffic and safety, want to see more information about that. I have a question about that. Because so many people thought that the hotel number one and two were included, did the police commission think they were included in this application? They did on a conceptual level. And the applicants explained to them that they'd be back for another master plan review before you. Um, Conservation Commission was generally in agreement with it. Um, oh, and the uh, Architectural Design Review Board also um, just reviewed it in a very preliminary sort of way. There wasn't really much architecture for them to comment on. Um, they just had a general motion to 
endorsed the master plan as submitted, but looks forward to reviewing the application as it comes back in various pieces. Um, now, regarding the height of the hotel, when that comes before you again, um, the normal height limit in the Maritime Heritage District is 35 feet, just measured from the ground to the midpoint of the roof. Um, the zone says that the commission can approve a building up to 45 feet, um, if it makes sense to do so, if the design is appropriate, if there's no negative impact. So that's something that you will have to consider. There's also the second height limit, this coastal design height, which is only 24 feet. Measured differently, I won't get into all the details, but that's something else the commission will have to consider whether to allow that to be waived when the time comes. So, you know, what I've heard is that um, the applicants, you know, would, would be okay with an approval that doesn't include the first two elements here, the hotel, in the Science Exploration Center. So as far as a recommended stipulation, if you were to approve this, um, we had a couple in the staff report, but replacing the number one we had there with a stipulation that the master plan approval does not include the proposed changes um, 5.1 and 5.2, which is the hotel and restaurant and science and exploration center at this time. Um, so the number two we had in the recommended stipulations, which was no decision is made on the maximum height of the proposed restaurant and hotel building. That's not needed anymore because that's not part of this, what you're approving. Even on a conceptual basis. Like the yeah, last I think it'd be premature. We've been talking about, we just want to leave you with, we're conceptually, this is where we're going, but, but the vote... Yeah, I think the, the vote wouldn't even taking, include has nothing to wouldn't do. include any conceptual approvals. Yeah. All right. Yes. Yeah. Right. And some other things we heard too is that um, the tent, the temporary tent, shall be up for a maximum of three years or two years, two years. Um, and used only for storage. Um, right, and that was another one that the... Right, you know, I had as just the master plan may include relocating the temporary tent further to the south, which is something we can work with them on to see if it programmatically works for them. Right, so it wouldn't have to come back to you just to move a little bit to the south. And also that the proposed detached sign shall not be illuminated. Is there anything else? Yeah, just over yeah. maybe you read A. And also um, proposed addition number three, which was the galley building, shall not exceed the building height of building number 50, of which is in addition to. In architectural design shall be contemporaneous to building number 50. So basically, the gallery edition will match the style of the gallery and the galley and won't be any taller. That is one, two, three, four, five. Do I hear a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. One more chance. I just want to, um, because they were looking for feedback, I did want to say that, you know, um, having the view, the, the realistic renderings of the view, not only from River, Ro River Road and immediately, but like from the bridge, from the overlook, the things that were mentioned today, which are really important to the feel of a seaport community be part of any proposal that you bring forward having to do with that hotel. And included in that is a light pollution study. You're, gonna, you're proposing to bring it onto the water. You're, it's a hotel. I'm assuming it will be lit at night. And we all know how light reflects off the water. The Mystic River is a very 
dark river at night, very serene. And we want to make sure that it stays that way. So thanks. Okay. Do we have a motion to close public hearing? Motion to close public hearing. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Oh. Is it just one? Aye. Do I have a motion on this application? I move to approve PZ1916ZC Mystic Seaport Museum with the um, five stipulations um, that Keith read. And just for clarification, oh, three through 12. And clarification, it's just three through 12 um, that was submitted. Don't we have to do the do we have to do the waivers and stuff? There are the, the waiver, the motion on the waivers. There's different individual decisions about conformance with the POCD and comprehensive plan, uh, decision on conformance with the Coastal Management Act we and the master those, plan itself. Don't we have those four things separately? Yeah, it could be. So included in, in the motion, um, Move to approve the waivers as requested. The traffic ones being approved because it's not the hotel, just for clarification. Um, decision that it does, 3 through 12, does conform to our plan of um, conservation development. Um, it does conform to the Coastal Management Act. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Second. Need more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Ayes on it. The effective date of this is uh, August 26th. Next application, PZ1915 SUP, Willers in Acquisition, LLC, special use permit application to increase existing seating in former restaurant from 60 to 100 seats and operate under a hotel liquor permit with the possible merger of the two lots, properties located at 20 East Main Street and 9 Patrol Street, Mystic Assessors Map, 182, Block 4, Lots 13 and 3, Zone DB-5. Do I have a motion to continue this application? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. To adjourn? So moved. Second. Aye.